Thank you all very much for coming and braving this wonderful weather. About time, finally, yes. We need it. This is, as you know, the Environmental Forum of Marin, the 2014 lecture series, uh, 30 seconds worth of history. Uh, I don't know how many of you know. Many of you are veterans, are members. Uh, Environmental Forum has uh, just celebrated uh, its 40th anniversary recently, uh, doing the what's now called the Master Class of All Day Tuesdays for four, five, six months. It varies a little. And starting about 10 years ago, they started this lec what's now called the lecture series of usually Saturday mornings, but they've been mixing in some Wednesday evenings. So in this year, and they range from six or eight or 10 or 11 uh, sessions, this year we have only four sessions. So you are uh, experiencing one of only a few special lectures in the 2014 lecture series. A week and a half ago, we had our first one on a Wednesday night at uh, uh, San Rafael City Council Chambers. How many of you were there for the fracking session? Virtually everybody, that's great. We had over 100 people, our most ever, so we're, we're doing something right, I think. It's great. Thank you all for coming. This second session, as you know, is on sea level rise, and we have a, I'm going to turn it over in a minute to a, our a daily coordinator who will introduce our co-coordinator and who will introduce our speakers, and we have a wonderful program for you. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Marin TV is taping all four sessions again. Thank you, Damien. Um, and we'll let you know if we have your email address. If not, make sure you give it to the front desk out there when we have posted that on our website, the video version. Uh, over the next few months, uh, the final uh, four weeks from today, we'll be here also on a Saturday morning to do our third session on wildfires. And uh, the fourth and final one will be in about two months, again, on Wednesday night. And this one will be at the San Rafael Corporate Center. You'll, in fact, there they are. All right. <laughs> it only took hours to figure that out. No, it's a, I do want to, uh, it, it, it's unusual that we get elected officials here, but we had a few last time, we have a few tonight that I want to introduce. Uh, again, for the second time, we have Belvedere City Council member Claire McAuliffe. Can I wave? And we have San Rafael City Council member Kate Collin. And we have Port of Madeira Town Council member uh, Diane First. Okay, let's see if I've forgotten anything. Oh, I do also want to acknowledge, rather than give a long list, though, we have, as always, a number of the Environmental Forum of Marin board members. I particularly want to mention board president Sarah Kelly. You want to raise your hand? Sarah, thank you. Thank you for all your valuable help. And other board members, want to raise your hands? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I think that's about all I have. I want to introduce now for one minute our the... Uh, the guy who's in charge of this facility, Bill Cope, will tell you important things like welcome and where the bathrooms are. Bill? <laughs> good morning, good morning, and welcome to the Bay Model Visitor Center. I'm Bill Cope, the senior ranger here and your host for the day. Uh, we really enjoy having the Environmental Forum, the speaker series. Uh, it's a real distinct pleasure. You'll have an opportunity later if you like. The model's open until 4 p.m. today to uh, have a chance to see that as well. Uh, if you need anything, any issues or questions, uh, please let me know. We're glad to take care of them. But uh, welcome again. Uh, we, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. And finally, thank you. Just before we, uh, uh, I introduce Vicki, I just want to give our usual disclaimer that uh, the forum as an organization remains neutral on issues and does not take positions on issues. Uh, please note that anything you hear tonight is not the direct opinion of the Environmental Forum of Marin. And uh, so with that, I, and hopefully the technology will work with any luck, and uh, with that I want to introduce the wonderful uh, Vicki Nichols, who is a tremendous, oh, we just got an, uh, Stephanie Moulton-Peters, a the town council member from Mill Valley. Welcome, Stephanie. Uh, Vicki Nichols has been a tremendous community volunteer in a number of areas, not least of which is the Environmental Forum of Marin, where she serves on the board and in fact is the treasurer of the board and is today's coordinator of this Sea Level Rise session, which means she does 90% of the work arranging all the speakers and the program and the venue and the 87 other things, and uh, I just stand up there and read the script they give me. So uh, please, yes. With my co-coordinator, Danny Goldman. Whom I'll let you right. introduce. <laughs> Well, good morning, all. I'm really happy to see the turnout here, uh, especially in the rain. Um, Sandy and I have um, brought forth some speakers, three speakers for uh, you today that are very knowledgeable, um, that are really on the forefront of working and planning and making, helping make decisions on sea level rise. 
um, not only are they going to give you some great information, but they're going to do it in a manner that's easily understandable. I've heard several of them speak, so it's going to be, I think you're going to learn a lot. Um, I want to start the, the, the morning out with some images that Sandy and I thought were really telling about sea level rise. And they come courtesy uh, of senior scientist Robin Grossinger of the San Francisco Estuary Institute. And what they show um, are, these were G GSIS images, um, and this is showing our bay as it looked in 1850. And we know that the effects of the 49ers added sediment um, to our bay and has caused a lot of fill. And here's the, the current image. You can see there's been a lot of fill, and uh, we've lost our wetlands and baylands significantly. Here's mean high tide, which is the prediction for 2000 or 2100. And as Robin reminded me in using these images, these are draft images. They're constantly being revised. And he wanted us to know that this projection of the sea level rise does not take anything, any man-made uh, infrastructure into account. So this would just be as if Mother Nature had free hand with this. And here's a comparison. And I think the thing that, uh, the reason I like uh, this image is that you can see that Mother Nature, as water is known to seek its own level, she's trying to do just that if these projections are right. And interestingly enough, you're going to hear from Roger and Sarah that the sediment that brought some of this fill is also a useful component of what will be involved in helping do restoration of our wetlands and and marshlands. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, let's see. They're um, specifically Roger, Sarah, and Christina. Roger Leventhal, Sarah Richmond, and Christina Hill are going to take you through their work that they're doing in, around the Bay Area and, and actually around the world, in Christina's case. And they're really involved in conducting studies, um, designing solutions, and planning for sea level rise. We're very fortunate in Marin County that we have many agencies that have given this a priority. And I've listed a, I left a handout in the back um, that was provided by Jack, Jack Leister, who works for the county on wet, uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your title, Jack. Um, planning manager. Plan, he's a planning manager, but working Community specific, development agency I'm working on, on sea level He's rights. working on sea level rights uh, quite a bit and very knowledgeable. And he's provided me with a list that I've left in the back as a handout of all the studies that Marin County is working on. So we have some really committed um, uh, agency people working on this. And I can already see just in our three speakers, they met here at 8.30 this morning. They know one another briefly. But I already saw a little bit of talking and collaboration. So I think we've got some really good people working on this. And we're very happy to have them um, speak with you today. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, first Roger Leventhal. Roger is the senior engineer of the Marin County Public Works Flood Control District, and he works within the watershed group. He's responsible for the assessment and engineering adaptation planning for sea level rise for the Marin County Flood Control District. Roger has an MS from UC Berkeley in hydraulics and coastal engineering and worked for over 23 years as a design consultant specializing in hydrology, hydraulic analysis, and creek and wetlands <coughs> restoration before he came to Marin County in 2011. He has designed, permitted, constructed, and monitored numerous water wetlands projects around the Bay Area and has particular experience in the beneficial use of dredged sediments. And as I mentioned earlier, he'll get into that more specifically, and the use with wetlands. Roger will talk briefly about sea level rise and projections along San Francisco Bay and how we're creating adaptive planning strategies for Marin County. Um, he's also going to talk to you about the Rambu Island Beach demonstration re restoration um, project. Roger helped design and construct this. And it is the first constructed gravel beach in the San Francisco Bay. It sits in Richardson Bay. And it was combined, uh, com it was constructed to combat wind wave erosion and sea level rise. And speaking also next after Roger, and they may be um, 
doing a little back and forth, their work overlaps, is Sarah Richman. Sarah holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Geology from the University of California at Santa Barbara and a Master's of Science degree in Energy and Resources for UC Berkeley. She has considerable consulting experience as a geomorphologist, hydrologist, leading surface, groundwater, and sediment transport studies, and developing designs for wetland and stream restoration projects. She's now serving a critical role at the BCDC, the Bay Conservation Development Commission, in making science accessible and actionable for, for our decision makers and general decision making. She is the lead for the Corte Madera Bay Lens and head of tide projects and a key player in adapting to Sea Tide's Hayward Resilience Study, which is known as ART. And I've provided handouts of those two particular projects back on the table if you'd like them. So today, uh, Sarah's going to lead us through her work on the Corte Madera Bay Lens project and her significant role in the, uh, the art project, the Adapting to Rising Tides Hay Hayward Resiliency Study. So they're both very knowledgeable, and um, I think you're going to enjoy their comments. Thank you both. And I forgot to ask you all to please turn off your cell phones if you haven't already. Thanks. OK. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as Vicki said, I'm going to start, and then Sarah and I, who actually cooperate quite a bit, we're going to trade off one time um, during the talk. Um, I think if you have, um, I think the idea is to hold off your big questions till the end if possible, but if um, there's anything that's confusing and you need clarification, because we have a lot to cover, we're going to go kind of at a good clip, uh, just be sure to raise your hand and grab my attention and we can clarify as we go along. Um, <laughs> that's a nice little play in music. Thank you. <laughs> Um, first question is, why are we in here in Marin interested and concerned about sea level rise? Well, uh, if you look at the, um, the edge chart, I sort of drew the current shoreline, and then I did one, albeit uh, slightly higher, a uh, number of 55 inches of sea level rise to make the point that uh, we are because we are probably, depending on how you look at it, either the first or second county in the entire San Francisco Bay Area who's most um, vulnerable and will be impacted by sea level rise. And you can just see that if you add in almost any measure of sea level rise, that areas that are currently um, cities and, and along this eastern edge of Marin County will, be, will become inundated. In fact, as I, you can see even on this cover slide, this is from just the King Tide from last year, which is a strictly an astronomical tide, a tide that happens just without any storm inputs. We already experienced roadway flooding around. This is at Tam High School on Miller Avenue and down in the right near here. Um, so we're a county that's, I'd say, uniquely vulnerable to uh, the impacts of sea level rise. Uh, we have very steep hills. It's part of it's why it's so beautiful to live here. Um, and then a very kind of narrow edge, urban edge, really. Um, so you may say, well, my house is up in the hills. I'm not directly impacted. But I would say, unless you're living off the grid and <laughs> growing your own vegetables and all that, most of the services you rely on, water, sewer, power, your roadways in and out, they're all down here in shopping, pretty much. So, um, so we all in Marin, I think, are very uh, uh, impacted and concerned about sea level rise. And we will go to talk a little about this. We have these steep watersheds and uh, flooding issues. And, um, <coughs> oh, and I'm going to talk in a little more detail about the area that I've spent most of my time uh, working on recently, which is the Richardson Bay um, part of Marin County. And then somebody did, uh, I think it was Pacific Institute, did a study for Caltrans looking at just <coughs> all, for all the Bay Area counties, which are the most impacted in Marin is number one in roads at, or sorry, number two in San Mateo by just a little bit, but per capita quite a bit, uh, miles of roads that are um, at risk due to uh, extreme events, sea level rise type events. Um, then you look at another table I grabbed out of the report of the value of buildings. And again, we're <coughs> second to San Mateo, but ahead of pretty much every other county. Um, given our small size of population, actually, per capita, uh, very at risk due to um, rising tides. So Vicki asked me to spend the first part before I give it to Sarah, and then I'll come back to talk about uh, just some background on sea level rise, um, you know, what it is, um, what causes it, what are the projections, and how does it map onto the marine shoreline. So um, you know, I'm not a scientist or a researcher, so be, you know, exactly how all this works together, that would be a different panel. <laughs> but, um, but I can, you know, in general terms, sort of describe it and sort of say what, what forces really influence the final bay tide level 
Um, and sea level rise is one component, but we have, of course, the astronomical forces, you know, the, the pull of the tides and the earth and the moon, sorry, the sun and the moon pulling on the tides. So we have, uh, um, so, I, I, so we have astronomical forces. We have more global forces, which is really uh, the melting of the Antarctic or Arctic ice sheets and glaciers. And there's been a lot of that in the news recently as yeah, those raise water levels. Um, we have regional forces, which are uh, uh, really um, important to understanding where the water surface goes. And those would be um, these called ENSO, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. You'll hear that term a lot if you hang out and read uh, about weather patterns. And this is where they measure the temperatures in the local Pacific Ocean. And they tell you if it's an El Nino year, a La Nina year, and all that kind of stuff. And that really impacts the water elevation. And then we have uh, local forces, which are really if the land's subsiding and raising. And you know, the actual sea level or the waves at your site really depend on um, local conditions of not just the ground surface, but the wind fetch. Because these are wind wave driven. Um, waves are typically wind wave driven in the San Francisco Bay. So this is a very complex. Um, I don't pretend to understand all the science of it. Oh, delta outflow is another regional input that affects where our water level is. Um, but I would say that there's a pretty a uh, wide and deep consensus <coughs> among scientists that climate change and sea level rise is real and is, is happening. Um, we certainly have a political divide on it, but I think even within that political divide, there's, um, <coughs> it, even on the conservative side, there's not so much that it's happening or not. I think it might be more the degree that it's man-made and what we can do about it. Um, but for us here in flood control on the ground dealing with um, impacts, you know, what's causing it is not as important to us as what, you know, the fact that it's happening that we have to prepare for. Um, if you're in the world of uh, greenhouse gas reduction and all that, then it's much more important to what's man-made versus what's natural. But um, you know, for us, we're dealing with this edge here where we all live, and what are we going to do to plan and prepare for the impacts? <coughs> so um, uh, what do we know uh, locally about sea level rise? And I'll explain this graph. We actually have a, are very lucky to have a hundred and something years of actual data at the Anoa Tide Station at Golden Gate. Uh, San Francisco has always been a harbor town, so you know the, the height of the tides within San Francisco Bay has always been of interest. So I think this might be the oldest continuously operating tide gauge in the whole country, mm -hmm. certainly west of Mississippi. So we have a very good record. Now you can plot data in a million different ways, and what the way it's plotted here is um, it's called mean monthly tides. So the tides all the way from 18 every month from 1854 all the way to 2013. Somebody uh, averaged the tide elevation for that month and plotted it. So there's something like 2,000 data points, um, and that's what these are. So you could have picked many different other things to plot. We have daily tides, but as you know, in San Francisco Bay, we have a higher high, high, a low, and a lower low every day, pretty much. So we have four different tide heights. So this plot averages out over the month and plots it, and it gives a nice record of the, and you can see a lot of spikes, of course. And then what they did is they ran a five-year moving average. So every month they would recalculate that five-year average. That's why it doesn't start until year five. And it gives you sort of an average picture. Really, it's just a picture of the tide level over time. Um, and then you can really see nicely the El Nino years sort of plotting its peaks. Mm -hmm. These four large red events are the El Ninos. Um, and what it's shown is that, you know, in measure, this is actual data. We have something like eight to nine inches over the last 100 something years. And it works out to somewhere in the two to something millimeter range per year. This is actual data, measured data at the uh, gauge of sea level rise. So now we're in the world of projections. So what do scientists think will happen? And then everything becomes a little more difficult. Um, obviously now in the world of climate modeling and, and very big things. And so this is that tide record up to where we are now. Oh, let me explain the axis. These are relative to 2000. So that's why it's sort of negative, but it's zero right at 2000. Um, it's this axis here, and these are the inches expected to rise. And if you just project out what historically was, it kind of looks like that. But there's a lot of work done by a number of people, and uh, this is the, you might have heard the IPCC, the International Panel of Climate Change Reports, that's the UN body, and a lot of heavy duty scientists and a lot of heavy duty universities cranking big models, and they're based on uh, scenarios of emissions, really, I think, and glacier melting. So one scenario is, you know, we all drive uh, Priuses, and then we're maybe at the lower end of this. Another one is we continue on with the way uh, growth has been going, and we see higher values. Um, and the range of numbers, you know, really does vary, but 
almost all the models and all of the results that, that we have to work with show acceleration. That's really key here. It doesn't just continue linearly. It starts accelerating somewhere around mid-century. And then we start really seeing uh, rates more like in the 6 to 8 to 9 millimeter per year range of sea level. And that's really what's driving a lot of our you know, concerns and our the impetus for planning uh, now and thinking about what we're going to do. Um, the projections are almost uniformly going up at some rate. You know, pick your number, but um, it's all uh, going to be problematic. Um, and then this, this is just out of the news from last week that they, I don't know if you guys, it was in the newspaper, uh, Chronicle even too, that they found some glacier that's record melt rates. Um, I think it was the same glacier that killed the Titanic or something. I'm not sure it hit the Titanic. <laughs> um, but uh, that they're measuring, so it's a, it's a good time to, get, to be a glaciologist, I think, when they study glaciers. I'm learning a lot about it. And, um, and it's all, every time they seem to do a projection, it seems to be that it's getting worse, as far as I can tell. Um, and then there's another way to look at data, which is just that record. And you can plot the peaks, and then you can do what they do for flood flows, which is do a statistical analysis and say, okay, this is the 100-year flood and the 10-year flood. You know, give some idea of the return interval. You can do that same thing with tides. And, what you can, and, and so we pick the line as the 55-inch line. Um, this is actually courtesy of a PWA, a consulting firm. Thank you. And, um, and then you can start laying out these curves, which say, you know, this is a recurrence interval. It's, it's a statistical number, but somewhere between two and 100 years, what the tide interval is. And then if you actually have a levy, you can start saying that the point of this slide is that, um, is that numbers that used to be, say, the two-year return interval um, in the future will now become sort of the standard, become the 100-year tide, which happens up much more frequently, right? Let me say that the other way around. The water level now that was 100-year or 50-year, now actually, if the tide goes up, becomes an event that happens every two years. So you start seeing that return flow, that return interval happening all the time. Um, and that's really what we're facing. So anyway, you cut and slice and dice the numbers, a rising tide is uh, very problematic for um, the Rhythm Coast. The latest and greatest numbers, which I give the URL here, and I think Vicky's going to put this online so you can <coughs> copy these. It's called the NRC, the National Research Council 2012 report. And they do it just for California. They do it actually for the Western US, but they have numbers for California. And they have a range rise of 6, 11, and 36. And they actually give it to years, which is, um, uh, they put year events on it. But the range, by the time you get out to 2100, is, is pretty big. It goes all the way up to 65 inches of uh, rain. Sorry, of the range at the upper end. And that's less than the number that, I, that graph I showed at the inundation. So something else you can do is if you want to play at home, you can start mapping sea level rise yourself because a lot of people have been making a lot of time on these viewers so for, for home use. So you can go, uh, so I've listed out a few here and I'll show some examples and then I'm turning it over to Sarah. So they have two different kinds of models, kind of two different ways of looking at it. There's these bathtub models which just crank the water level up and then level it right onto the land. And then there's the more sophisticated models that are happening now which account for wind wave energy and impacts. And this is obviously much more real and I'll show examples of these right now. So the big one that everyone's using is the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer. The URL is here. And you can go to the site and figure out where you are. We're over there. And start cranking up the water level and take a look at what happens. Um, actually, for fun, you should also go over to Florida and just crank the water level up one foot. And the whole state like, disappears. <laughs> so we're lucky here, actually, that we don't have a, we're not quite in a bad situation. So, but for the Bay Area, it kind of looks like this, and you have control over here. And you can go anywhere from one to six feet, and then you can zoom in and see if your neighbor's property is flooded. <laughs> so, um, RIM map, courtesy of uh, RIM planting, also RIM planning department. Um, also, has put these NOAA maps onto RIM map, and you can then plot all sorts of schools and hospitals and critical structures, and put those onto the map, and also put these same NOAA uh, sea level rise. Um, markers and see what happens, so you can do that, it's all, you can do this all at home. Um, in flood control, we put them on with some more detailed aerials, which is 16 to 55 inches, so we can really see, because we're concerned in drainage and flooding on a, a very much of a um, neighborhood, you know, block by block scale, so we look at it much more in depth, fine way, so to speak. Um, and this is the one for Heidi uh, Creek, and you can see a lot of uh, areas, are, and this is just direct coastal flooding, this is not riverine flooding, which we'll talk about here in a sec. Uh, Point Blue, uh, former PRDO, they've done some great work. They have their own viewer you can get uh, here, I guess here, and they look at much more, uh, if you're interested in impacts to marshes and the critters and what happens to the yellow-bellied sapsucker, what happens to it, sea level rises and shade, so you can, 
So and we learned about that from their viewer. It's really a great tool. Okay, now for waves, there's two big ones. So the our Coast, Our Future, which is a USGS Point Blue effort. They currently have finished modeling the Pacific Coast, and they're now moving into San Francisco Bay. Um, there are URLs here, and you can then play with all sorts of scenarios. The one I have here is a 100-year uh, wave height. Again, all this stuff can be put to return intervals of 100 year, and I cranked it up with 50 centimeters of sea level rise, and I'm really interested in Stinson Beach. So this gives me the wave heights, but it will give you water surfaces and velocities and a whole host of things. So you can uh, play with whatever scenarios you want and um, kind of learn more about the impacts in the future. <coughs> Um, FEMA does not consider sea level rise, but I wanted to put a few FEMA maps up because they are the basis for the flood insurance maps, which affect a lot of people in Marin. So the red are, flood, are areas of flood, uh, are wave heights less than three feet, and the blue soles, people who live in the blue areas unfortunately have wave heights greater than three feet, so they pay a lot more insurance. Uh, but what we're doing is we're taking the FEMA models and uh, manually cranking them up for sea level rise ourselves. And this is just a couple examples of the FEMA maps right near here in Marin City. This is no sea level rise, this is just a 100 year direct coastal crossing the road. So these are all within the flood zone. Same with this Tiburon Boulevard up there, or Tiburon, this sort of uh, flooding of the highway. Um, and then we're also, before I get to share here, is, um, you know, we, uh, it isn't just the, the coast, it's also the watersheds. So we're very in Marin looking at the, this is the Coyote Creek watershed. Um, and you enter this world of, now you're really in the world of, you know, uh, of coincident, of, you know, Rainfall timing with tides, which is kind of a whole other very heavy technical area that I won't go into except to say, make you aware of it that, you know, what causes flooding, which is really what we're interested in, is also what comes out of the watershed against what tide height. So you're in this sort of statistical world of uh, floods and tides and them happening together. And it's something we're um, working on in the Coyote Creek watershed. Um, so now we're going to transition and we're going to sort of preview here. Sarah's work, and we're going to talk, start moving over to adaptation strategies. And then there's a whole host here, and I'll come back to some of these later. But Sarah's going to talk about marshes and wetlands, and I'm going to come up and talk about beaches. Essentially, we're going to talk about two natural approaches that provide habitat and deal with sea level rise. That's supposed to be a break, but I think you can. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Roger, for uh, that introduction. And I'm going to just pick up on where he left off. And he mentioned the difference between bathtub and wave models. And the reason why it's important that we're working towards these wave models is because waves can erode, oops, sorry, let's see, pointer. Waves can erode our shorelines. And certainly waves can also increase the potential for overtopping structural features like levees or berms. So waves are important to consider in terms of flooding. And mudflats and marshes actually provide that first line of defense against coastal flooding. And throughout this talk, I may refer to mudflats and marshes as valens. That's sort of a term that we use to uh, refer to those two features together. And so balens can actually knock down wave heights. As those waves travel through shallow water, they encounter these balens. And so balens can be part of sea level rise adaptation. Now, it turns out that there's actually very little data about how these balens actually reduce wave heights, and even less data about how these balens may be able to help as sea level rises. So BCDC recognized this critical data gap and developed the Cordomadera Balens Sea Level Rise Adaptation Strategy Project, which was really an aim to fill this data gap by collecting measurements of wave heights, along the mudflats and marshes and thinking about how they will change as water levels rise with different wave heights and as vegetation changes also due to sea level rise. And so BCDC is really trying to help the region adapt to sea level rise and so got researchers together from institutions, got consulting groups, got a lot of folks that are um, just high-class scientists in this region to come together for this project. And our role was then to translate the science they collected into a sea level rise adaptation strategy. And now while our strategy is specific to Corte Madera Balins, lessons that we learned can be applied throughout the region. 
These are some of the partners that we worked with, and again, our work would not have been possible without funding from US EPA and generous contributions from our researchers and Marin County, so thank you. We're happy to uh, have worked with you all. And I just want to show you a little um, overview of the Cordoma Balin site. And here we have, um, Cordum, we obviously have Timberon Peninsula right here, and so our site is just north of that. And we have Cordomadera Creek flowing into the bay. And at the mouth of the creek, we have the Larksburg Ferry Terminal, which is dredged in this channel every three to four years. Our three marshes that we focused on are here within the Cordomadera Ecological Reserve, managed by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the site is adjacent to residential, commercial, and industrial development. So here's a closer look at the marshes that we were thinking about. We have Muzzy Marsh in the south, and this was one of the early restoration projects in the bay. We have North Muzzy, directly north of that, and we have its eroding uh, dike here. And then closest to the creek is Hurt Marsh, which was a special site in the bay because it was never diked or filled. Now we collected our wave measurements just straight through the bay. So I'm going to walk through a tide cycle and um, Roger described how we have sort of two unequal high and unequal low tides every day and by walking through this tide cycle you'll start to see how specific conditions at our site really governed what kind of wave measurements we were able to collect. And as Roger also pointed out, wind waves vary throughout the region. They depend on things like wind speed, direction, fetch, as well as mudflat width and marsh width. And so our findings are specific to Corte Madera, but I think provide lessons for other places as well. So at low tides, and again, um, We've got this axis here, so you can follow along with me. It's just two days. And then here is the height of the water surface. So I'm looking at the a typical low tide at the Cordomadera Balins, and we can see that water levels are just covering the mudflats. And so any waves that would be occurring are going to be interacting with the mudflat. At a mid or a high tide, we still have just water inundating the mudflat and possibly interacting with our vertical marsh edge or a scarp as well. But water levels are not up on the marsh yet. It's only at extreme tides, and this is a photo from the king tide, not this year, but the year before, where the water levels are high enough that water is able to flood the marsh. And obviously in this photo, there were no wind waves, but if there had been wind waves, then those waves would have been interacting with the marsh plain and the marsh plain would have been able to um, assist in knocking down those waves. And so the point I want to make here is that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, the mudflats are really providing the muscle of interacting with any wind waves that occur and facilitating to knock them down. Whereas at high water levels on these special occasions, that's when the marsh is really going to do the work of interacting with those wind waves. So I want to walk you through some cartoons to describe our findings from our measurements. At the top we have, you know, a typical wave, and we found that as that wave comes across the mudflat and towards the shore, it decreases in height. And that's because as the water gets shallower, you know, the waves are feeling the bottom and they're breaking and they're losing energy to friction. Now, um, we found on average that wave heights decreased by 66% as they traveled across the mudflats to the marsh edge. And in the best case scenario, in really shallow water, the wave heights decreased by 80%. And so this graphic shows our high tide line again, and then a low tide line, and the waves are the same size, and we can see at low tide, this wave height is reduced a lot more than if it were at high tide. And so this is really bringing home the point that water level is critical to understanding how these wave heights are reduced. And hence the title, shallow water reduces flood risk the most. And the reason this is important is because if we're losing the ability to knock down waves at higher water levels now, we know that sea level rise is only gonna increase our water levels. And so 
we need to take that into consideration if we want to use our wetlands as that first line of defense for coastal flooding. So we actually didn't measure high water levels during our study period on the marsh. So we used models to explore these higher water levels and start to get a look at what might happen as sea level rises. So this plot is a summary of some of our modeling results. And on the x-axis, we have marsh width. And so this is the edge of the marsh, and this is moving inland. So this is you know, where a community might be, for example. And for reference, North Muzzy Marsh is about this wide, 1,000 feet, and then the marshes on the either side of it are, are even wider. And now this is just going to show sort of an index of our ability to knock down those waves. So as this line gets lower, it means that we're knocking down the waves even more. And I'm going to show you various water levels here, each with a two-foot wave at the marsh edge, and we're going to look at how much marsh width is needed to knock that two-foot wave down to a one-foot wave. So the Corte Madera marsh plain is at that roughly six feet. And so at a seven-foot water level, in order to get to this one-foot wave height, we only need a very narrow marsh to knock down those waves, about 40 feet. At a higher water level, say a nine-foot water level, and this could be comparable to like a 100-year water level, we can see that we need a significantly wider marsh, about 180 feet, because there's so much more water depth over that marsh. And so to me, this really makes the point. We increased water level over the marsh by just two feet, but in order to provide the same level of flood protection, we have to have an 800 foot wider marsh. And if we think about maybe the 100 uh, year water level with um, say one foot of sea level rise, for example, then we can see that you know, we're really off the chart. We need an even wider marsh to provide that same level of flood protection. And did you have a clarifying Why question? Are you not including mud flat in this analysis? Because this is the, uh, the modeling that we did focused on the marsh because we weren't able to get measurements. So there's a, a different analysis that I'm not presenting today that integrates both. Yeah, thanks. Um, and so we also did the same analysis looking at a three foot wave to see are the results any different if we had a three foot wave at the marsh edge and then tried to reduce that, reduce that to a one foot wave. And the story is the same. It really depends on water level. Water level is more important than wave height in terms of a factor to take into consideration in thinking about flood protection. We did also look at vegetation and try to understand what role does it play in this first line of defense of coastal flooding. And we found from our modeling alone that whether you have sort of mid-marsh pickleweed or low-marsh cordgrass, the results looked fairly comparable. However, if you had no vegetation at all, if you lost your vegetation, then you would lose, for example, at an extreme water level, say half as much of your effectiveness to reduce those wave heights. So we want vegetation there. It just appears, given our limited understanding right now with the model, that which species doesn't make a huge difference. So to summarize, we want that high, wide, vegetated marsh to provide the maximum flood risk reduction. We want it to be high, because that will help us have that shallow water over the marsh, which effectively reduces wave heights in a narrow space. But at those <coughs> higher water levels, we need it to be wide in order to provide that same level of protection. So I want to just show what the future looks like for Corona Madera Marsh if we do nothing. So here are some results describing how the marsh we have now, which has a little bit of high marsh, mid marsh, and some low marsh, it's look According to the models, it looks like it's going to downshift. So the high marsh becomes mid marsh, mid marsh becomes low marsh, and low marsh eventually becomes mud flat by the end of the century, if we do nothing. Now this site um, in the south, Muzzy Marsh, was an early restoration project. So we restored tidal action, and that has been a very successful project. But that project didn't consider all of the processes that historically supported these balans because you know, there were serious constraints like housing de and development behind it. But if we look at a 19, excuse me, an 1850s image of what the marsh used to look like, we can see that there used to be extensive tidal networks, 
We had sort of a wet meadow fringing the site. We also had a connection between Cordomadera Creek and the marsh. And so we may not be able to return the site to this image, given where we are at now, but we can think about how management measures and engineerings can mimic or recreate some of these processes which historically supported our baylands. And so I think at this point, um, I'm just going to pause before I get into some of those management measures and, and check to see if there's any loose ends or quick questions. We know from the tsunami and from <coughs> tidal waves that as it gets shallower in the, in the ocean, the waves get higher. How is, that, how is that different then with a mud? It's maybe more understandable with the friction in the, in the marshes themselves. But why does that not happen in the mud flats? That the wave heights increase as the yes. water, as it shallows? Um, you know, I think that I'm going to have to follow up with you on that question. I don't, Roger, do you have a good answer? I mean, I'm not a great one, but I think tsunamis are a really totally different kind of wave. So there's like a huge amount of water behind it. It's a very, very super long period of like miles. And, and so it's not like just a breaking wave. It's this huge wall of water that keeps pushing up. So I think it's just a very different process. Yeah, that, that's not what we're finding here, but it's a good distinction. I suspect it's the difference between deep ocean waves and wind-driven local waves. Yeah. yeah. Because in the deep ocean waves, most of the wave is actually circulation of water below the surface. Mm -hmm. And in wind-driven waves, it's more a surface phenomenon. And that's probably why. That's, that's a good answer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I wrote the EI on the early March, so I know a lot of that. I've monitored for 25 years. Um, and what I know is that um, it has taken 20 some odd years for the vegetation to expand and reach the edge of the bay. Um, there is a, a dike, the former dike that wasn't put in there in the 50s, that is now retreating. It is, it is eroding. Right. Where that dike is eroding, at the breaches, there were four breaches, and at each one of the breaches, um, now the vegetation is retreating. So it reached the edge, and now it's being eroded. So uh, we have been asking for 20 years why BCDC doesn't put the fill, the uh, dredge spoils that they're getting from the channel. Yeah, this is a great oh, segue why, into my next part. Why, <laughs> why don't they preserve this resource that no longer is getting washed out of the hills from the gold mining? They're, they're wasting a resource. And my question to you is, what's the matter with BCDC? <laughs> <laughs> well, can, can I hold it to respond to your question? Let me present, let me present the, the strategy that we came up with to address that issue, because it is certainly a factor for thinking about sea level rise. So without further ado, I'm going to press on. Um, so I'm going to talk about the strategy we came up with for Permanent Air Balance, and then I'm going to pass it back to Roger, who's going to explore more of these nature-based solutions to coastal flooding based on his work. And as, as Vicki mentioned, we can see from maps showing sea level rise 2100 that sort of the bay is coming back, if you will. And so we have an opportunity to sort of rethink about our shorelines and design them to be more dynamic, perhaps, to accommodate dynamic changes in our bay. And the permanent shoreline is is no longer possible given changes in our environment. And so the key thing about these baylands and why, unlike built solutions, I think they're particularly promising is because they do have a natural capacity to adapt. And so this cartoon shows how as water level rises, the whole profile can actually shift you know, upward and landward to sort of get out of the way of this increased energy. Now, these systems depend on sediment as building blocks in order to build upward and migrate backward. And scientists have been finding that it appears there's decreasing sediment supply in the bay. And we also know from some of the images that I just showed and your own personal experience that in many cases there isn't room for these balins to migrate landward because of development pressures. And so 
as a result, we may have to think about some strategies to help them along. And the point that was raised is that working with nature can take time for things to be established. And that's why I'm so glad to be having this conversation with you all today is because I think we can try to sort of work with nature now before it gets too critical and that we can build some of this dynamism into our shorelines as sea level rises. So here's a illustration just showing some of the processes that historically have helped build up our marshes. We've got um, our tidal marsh here and we can see that it's sandwiched between sort of a dynamic estuarine system and a terrestrial system. And I'm gonna show you that same image now in plan view and we can see that we have waves that when there is coarse material available, they can build up beaches. We've got tides that bring in fine sediment from the bay through these networks where deposition sort of decreases away from the channels. And then we have hill slope processes and streams that bring sediment from our watersheds into the back of these marshes. You know, and in some cases, we even have streams that flow all the way into the bay. But in many cases, you know, we've sort of uh, diked our marshes. We've got roads that have blocked these terrestrial processes from occurring and delivering that sediment. Or we have flood control channels that um, are trying to just move things to the bay as opposed to build up things along the side. And in the past, a lot of the restoration has been focused on sort of filling big holes behind levees, either through artificial uh, sediment placement or fine sediment processes, but I think we can really expand our concept of restoration moving forward to take into account these wave, hill slope, and stream processes because harnessing a variety of these processes will increase resilience for our balins. And what we found in this project is that increasing the resilience of our balins increases the resilience of our communities behind them. And so it's really a win-win. So for the Quarterman Air Project, we looked at these seven strategies. And I'll walk through a few of these in more detail. But I want to mention that many of these management measures are really in their early phases. We have a project, for example, that's being led by the Conservancy looking at oyster reefs and how those may knock down waves. It's called the Living Shorelines Project. We have some early efforts to look at um, how to use wastewater at the back of our marshes and think about if there's a possible um, advantage there for sea level rise. But for most of these measures, we really need to learn more from pilot projects so that we can implement them with more success. So we looked at these measures and described the, benef the general sort of benefits and constraints, implementation details, and then some natural and constructed examples in our report but we had to then ask ourselves, well, which measures make the most sense at Corte Madera? And the way we decided was by looking at our site and measuring the specific processes that were occurring there and then identifying how specific measures affected those processes. And the point here is that there's really no one size fits all for increasing shoreline resilience. It depends on your site and so you have to understand the processes that are working there so that you can use you know, nature as a palette, and then develop a strategy. And the point of our uh, study was to sort of de demonstrate how to develop a strategy. We did not go to that next step and develop designs or implement any of these measures. So this is at the conceptual level that I'll be speaking. So the first thing that we observed was by looking at the shoreline, we could see that over the last 150 years, it appears the mudflat has been generally eroding. You know, that's not true for every point in time, but generally it has been eroding, and that the edge of the marsh has retreated almost 500 feet over the last 150 years. And we talked about the importance of marsh width for knocking down waves, and so we wanted our first measure to address this uh, marsh edge erosion. And one way of doing that would be to buffer the wave action by constructing a coarse beach along the marsh edge, like that which naturally occurs at Outer Bear Island. And Roger's gonna speak to you in a lot more detail about the Aramburu Island, which we looked at and relied on heavily, heavily to think about how this kind of measure would make sense at our site. 
And by looking at his work and then thinking about our site, we realized that things like, you know, where is the supply of coarse grain coming from? How would you construct it? There's a lot of specific details that are going to vary on the site scale. But this was a promising thing to look at further. Um, the next process that we looked at was how the Cordomadera Marsh is sort of building up through time. How is it vertically <coughs> accreting sediment in order to keep pace with sea level rise? And the measurements indicate that right now, it is keeping pace with sea level rise, but we found something that was particularly interesting. And that is that this rate of sedimentation appears to be decreasing. At most sites, we found that you know, there's more sediment now than there was in the past, and the opposite was true at Cordomadera. And so this phenomenon sort of made us think about what are some of the other things that we're observing. And so if we think about the accretion rate, the fact that we have erosion, the fact that we've got um, um, a lost connection between Cordillera Creek and our Balans, as well as sort of a diked ferry channel which acts like a sediment sink. All of these pieces of evidence suggested that we have a sediment limited system. And so the next measure was trying to address this sediment limited system. And one way of increasing the local sediment supply is through an idea called mudflat and marsh recharge. And that involves taking dredged material and placing it on the mudflat or just depositing it in the water column, sort of on the mudflat as close to the marsh as possible, and then letting natural processes bring that sediment into the marsh. Now this idea has been done in other places, like the UK, but it has not been tested in the Bay Area yet. And so this is a place you know, for active research in the future. <coughs> Another way to increase the local sediment supply and, and build up the marsh is actually to help that sediment to get into the marsh. And since those channels are the pathways for moving that material, we could excavate additional channels or increase the channel density and complexity on the marsh. And then we could even take that excavated material and build up levees along the side. And that would create high marsh habitat which the critters particularly love, you know, to escape these high tides and avoid um, getting too wet. So the strategy that I was describing with coarse beaches, augmenting the, the sediment supply here, and then bringing that into the marsh, that's really the first part of our sea level rise strategy. And it really is focused on how to maintain the existing marsh footprint. But at some point, as Roger showed in his slide, sea level rise will accelerate so much that the marsh may not be able to keep pace and it may need to move landward to avoid being squeezed between a rising bay and a steep inboard levee. And so the second phase of the strategy involves building a transition zone for that marsh to move onto. And here we have a photo of um, North Muzzy Marsh and this is a seasonal wetland complex and then here's a stormwater basin and I've been learning that there's planning going on right now about what to do with this place. We didn't know that that project was going to come up when we were developing the strategy, but it's a really exciting opportunity to think about how to build in resilience to this site. And yeah. so what that... May yeah, I comment on that? Because I'm the council member in Port of That site that you have highlighted in mm -hmm. green is owned by Golden Gate Bridge right. District. Right. It, they have used it for mitigation for many years. And that's, uh, there's a lot of pompous grass out there because it's you know up out of the current tidal action. Mm -hmm. So Golden Gate Bridge District um, is you know we're in talks with them to finally clean it up and restore it. Great. So um, it was that channel for the ferry terminal. Right. 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 For many years, that's where they um, they put the ferry slots. Right. And and I will describe here. You know certainly. This is a, um, a graphic illustrating what that green box could look like in cross-section. And so you have sort of your tidal marsh here, and then you've got this very gentle slope. And in places where you know, there is storm water, you can actually seep water through the slope and possibly get some water quality benefits. Um, the idea really is that you're emulating that wet meadow that historically ringed the sites. But the details for for exactly the water quality benefits you know, are, are being worked out in a pilot project that I mentioned. So I, I can't speak too conclusively on that right now. But one thing about building the slope that I do want to mention is that it, it involves converting you know, one land use into something else. And so the trade-offs do need to be considered, and that's certainly um, 
something that BCDC is having a lot of conversations on about right now, about when this kind of um, approach would be useful or, or how to start making those decisions. Um, another thing I want to mention is that there's several ways to build up this gentle slope. You could sort of build the slope in stages or some other ideas from Peter Bay and others are that you could also kind of have slurry mm -hmm. deposition onto the back of the slope to kind of keep it uh, maintaining itself over time. So there's a lot of details on this that are yet to be explored. Um, and what I've done in, in here is sort of shown some of these measures in um, this graphic to, to illustrate that not time up here, but sea level rise may be a way that we may need to start thinking about when to implement certain measures. These measures may only be effective for certain amounts of sea level rise, and then we may need to transition to the next management measure because then it will provide the solution that we're needing. And so with this dynamic bay, we're going to have to use adaptive management and sort of learn by doing and monitor and constantly think about how things are performing as we move forward. And this is just one factor to include in adaptive management, sort of how sea level is rising, but we also have to think about you know, what's going on with our tide gates and our levee maintenance. And are there policy changes that are coming out of the agencies? These are unknowns, and so we're gonna have to work really flexibly moving forward. And I think Jeremy Lowe refers to it as Renaissance shoreline managers. We're gonna need to have you know, a geomorphology hat, a planner hat, a regulator hat, we're really going to have to get out of our silos in order to rethink these shorelines to accommodate multiple benefits. And one effort that BCDC is working on right now, which Vicki described, is the Adapting to Rising Tides effort. And the project began along the Alameda County shoreline, and it was trying to pull together a diverse group of stakeholders and recognize that many of these adaptation issues are complex and cross-cut our typical boundaries. And so right now, um, we developed some tools at the county scale that we're actually using at more neighborhood scales. Here's a map of one of our focus areas along the Hayward shoreline. We're doing the same thing close to the Oakland airport. And we're trying to refine some of our adaptation responses by using some folks that know these places like the back of their hand. So it's an exciting process that we're, we're working on, and we're really doing this collaborative planning at multiple scales. We're also working with the region on how to create sort of more resilient shorelines. It's a project that is just getting underway, underway right now, but the idea is we're trying to develop tools so that folks in their communities can start thinking about the assets they know so well and work with their decision makers to move forward. And so with that, um, Roger's gonna take you through some other adaptation Okay. Measures. Okay, thank you. Um, I think a thread in this is that, at least for me especially, is um, these natural analogs offer, you know, they're providing us a flood control uh, benefit or a service. So I provide, in addition to providing all these other uh, values such as habitat and, and resiliency. So I'm going to show you now um, a project that I designed um, with Peter Bay before I came to Marin County. And it just, when we, get, we built it, just uh, finished building it just uh, after I got to the county. And it's probably the first, um, it's a demonstration project of an engineered bay beach, and it's the first one that I know of. I believe in the entire bay that's actually been built. And we've been monitoring the last two years, and it's been working really nicely. So, this is uh, Richardson Bay, and the Rambu Island, for those who may know, is this little sort of backwards horse, uh, monkey ranch looking island. It's, it's mostly artificial. It was. Uh, made the bottom half is dredge sediment when they dredged sort of a channel there. And then when they built these homes up here at Strawberry, they took the hill slope, the uh, uh, deposits, and they put them onto the island. I think initially they were originally planning to build more homes hmm. out onto the island, and then it got a bunch of steel showed up and et cetera, and BCDC put a stop to that. This is probably the 60s and 70s. And now it's a bird, a sanctuary. Um, uh, luckily for us, maybe unluckily for the birds, um, in 2007 there was a big oil spill in the bay, and a bunch of oily <coughs> birds washed up on the Rambu Those are the little red and black dots, and um, so that led to a fund of about close to a million dollars, um, of which the beach used about half, being available to use for design and construction of this demonstration project um, from the Costco of the sand oil spill, some of you may remember. 
Um, like Sarah alluded to, you know, the erosion of Ramburu Island had eroded up to about 70, 80 feet um, in just 20 years or so. It really gets the full brunt of uh, wind wave energy. We have sort of we the pre construction shoreline looked like this, uh, scarped. Here's another view. This is like a three or four foot scarp along the edge. This is the hill slope on top of sort of this bay mud. Um, there's a, a ruler. Um, um, so it was an island that was actively eroding. And it's a good, and it's a good, perfect place to build a project where you're an engineer because there's so little liability. Mm -hmm. Pretty much it's just birds on top. And no one really could have filed a lawsuit against you if it wasn't work. So it's a great spot for a demonstration project. Um, well, I wanted to make this thing just to show here. I'm showing the scarp on the island. And I'm going to go back to these, but showing some of the active scarping along the, uh, the current red shoreline. This is along the Mill Valley, across from the dog parks. You can see the sort of uh, slump blocking on the marsh edge. This is wind wave erosion action. Um, this is the way marshes erode. It's not sort of beautifully uniform. You'll often get this sort of blocky falling off of the shoreline, and then it washes away. This is also along the shoreline. This is uh, another view of it where I've uh, demarcated things a little bit. The scarped edge, scarping being a geomorphic term for sort of that erosional cliff edge that you'll see around a lot of the uh, places that are actively eroding. Um, this is one on Seminary Drive, and I, I showed these for a reason that I'll come back to. Here we have a scarp right at the end of where they dumped a lot of riprap um, of about six feet or so. You can see this pipes, they didn't install the pipes like that, it's eroded back by or six feet. Um, so back to Rambu Island, I just wanted to make the analogy that this scarping is a real, is a real active concern for our Mill Valley shoreline, or sorry, Marin shoreline, even beyond Mill Valley. So this is the island again, Ramburu, and I'm just making some of the uh, so the logistics here of the design is a, a very long fetch. So in the bay, our biggest winter storms are from the south, many of you may know. Uh, most of the time the winds are from the west, but in the winter we get these southerly storms often. It's, um, and then from that direction we have about an eight mile wave fetch. Wave heights and you know, three feet, maybe even more in wave period, sort of the coastal engineering uh, data from the project. But the point to take away is that it actually gets a lot of erosion and it's not ideal because the angle of attack of the waves actually isn't shore normal, which makes this project, made it much more difficult. <coughs> the tendency of the waves to push the sediment um, in a direction be much nicer if it was just coming straight on shore. Um, and so a little more about the project. Like I said, the first uh, design beach, engineered beach, um, and, and we constructed over two years with the gravel part, gravel back cobble berm constructed one year, and we got some sand. You know, we really didn't have a ton of money. It, Richardson by Audubon was the client. So this was a, uh, we didn't do a lot of the fancy modeling. We used a lot of sort of empirical design work. And we used different size of material. And we took our analogy, like Sarah showed, from some of the natural reference sites. This is out at uh, Bear, where you can see sort of the, you know, the wave energy. I mean, that's the point of this, is that the, the material, is, it moves. You want it to move. And it, it adjusts um, to the local wind wave climate, so in a sense, but I tell my engineer friends that they're like tiny little rip wrap. <laughs> You're talking big stuff that's designed not to move. It's an approach that, you know, working with nature, you need to give it more room, but in a sense, you want it to move and adjust. And through that movement, it actually has much more stability and resiliency. Um, um, we went to a bunch of sites around the bay and did a bunch of survey measurements and such, and I'm not showing all that. And then the design looks something like this. Three different cells, depending on wave energy, so the highest to the south, um, and then to the, this, the black dots are the gravel, the sort of brown is the sand. And then we put a lot of, we, we made up a term called micro groins. Uh, you know, we record those big groins that stick way out. That you know, these, you go to Florida, you see a lot of beaches that are always sort of concave. But this is the idea, there used to be a lot more wood in the, in the bay system, by the way. That's very natural. Before we uh, dived off, and, you know, all the areas up in Sacramento, I mean, the annual storms would bring down tons of woody debris. And they would wash up. So if you walk around a lot of coastal beaches and just look around, you'll see a lot of driftwood and all that. And it's actually helping to stabilize the beach. So it's a system. So we tried to recreate that. We didn't get as much of the small stuff as I would have liked. Um, but we got some of the big groins, which I'll show you here. They're in construction. And then, then there was a whole design that I'm not talking about because it's not the beach of uh, season, uh, seasonal wetland types. That's in the uplands. But the beach part is essentially, and we use oyster shell up here. So there's a whole other part, and I'm leaving off about the material types, but you might say bigger gravel cobbles here, smaller here, and then even smaller here with more oyster shell. So 
you have to have worked in the Bay a long time to appreciate being able to put Phil into the Bay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> one of the first projects to ever get actually approved from BCDC to add Phil for restoration purposes. There's only five or 6,000 yards, but there it is going into the Bay. Um, so we're starting to lay out the gravels. Um, these are some of the micro groins being put in, these you know, eucalyptus um, that we're, we're able to get them for free, essentially, kind of hook and crook a little bit on this project. Um, here we are, here looking at them again. Um, this is uh, laying out some of uh, the different sources of gravel material. We actually used a waste gravel. For those who know, there's a, lot of, there's a fair amount of sand mining in the bay. The sand miners want sand, but they don't want the gravel. Uh, so they have waste piles of it, and we want it. That's really the stuff we want. So we were able to get it at a very, very good price and reused a uh, product that is just sort of wasted in the bay currently because it's really what we want. Um, just some more construction photos. I'll skip through these. There you go. I love, love that. This is laying out the sand. Sandy foreshore. Um, so we got some monitoring photos and then I'll move on to a new topic. This is pretty much post construction with the sand. This is the oyster shell. It's been worked a little by the daily tides but has yet to experience a big storm at this point. Then you get to hear February posts the first set of storms and it's, you know, it's uh, so far looking nice. This is where that scarp was roughly, you saw before. Um, then in March of 2013, we got a series about a year ago, a very, very large winter storms, you may remember, just from the south. Really, a, a lot of wave energy hit the island. And these are the event, just post those storms. And just, you know, it's holding together quite nicely. It's almost textbook for the sand. And, the, and the, you want the uh, back area to move and adjust to, the, in, to that wave energy. Um, and this is from last fall. So, of course, over the summer, the sand tends to move up as it happens in normal beaches. And then in the winter, it tends to go out and, uh, um, and the gravel. So there's a lot of gravel and all that. Just is just right below the surface of the sand in this photo. So this is as of last September. Okay, so you know, two years of monitoring has been a really, I think it's just been a, um, a really great success. So, um, and then this is just a transect we took. And what this is shows you is just kind of graphically what I just said. This is the site survey, and that EW EHW is extreme high water, and the profile, the beach profile, is adjusted to match that extreme high water. We didn't build it that high. It's moved up a little bit, and it will move down. And it's uh, that's natural systems, which what you want. You want that resiliency uh, without having to engineer something that just doesn't move. Oh, and then the birds. Um, you know, I'm the engineer, not the birder, but the birds really love it. The oyster catchers, I think those are, with the orange beaks and terns, <laughs> like crazy, and the bird counts. So um, if you connect with Richardson Bay Audubon on Facebook, they have a lot of more information about the bird usage of the island. It's been really great. Um, and then we're also letting you know we're looking at doing more demonstration projects for applying for grants. One reason I showed those sites, Seminary Drive and Mill Valley and Outer Bothine. Uh, like Sarah said, we need to build more of these because we need to understand where they work and where they want. And that was limits that engineering design manual, the guidance manual, so the private firms will do this, has yet to be developed. And until we cross over that hump, you, you won't have this implemented because there's too much liability in coastal engineering. You can't expect a design firm to go, I mean, riprap, shoreline will definitely you know, not get you sued. <laughs> but putting a beach in, you know, you have, we have to know more about where they work. That's kind of where we're at. So before I get in, now I'm going to move over to adaptation a little bit and then pass it on to Christina. Um, but I just want to give a quick tour of our shoreline. This is out of uh, sort of Blackie's Beach, and you can kind of see the erosion here. And you can see San Rafael, what people typically do, more typical coastal engineering, that riprap shoreline kind of where we're heading. This is kind of in the world of uh, sea walls, flood walls. We'll be seeing more of these. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. So people sort of deal with the rising sea level on their own. Um, and this is out of San Quentin, just from the ferry. You can see we have a future of, if we don't get in front of it, where we're heading is a future of walls and rocks essentially along our shoreline. So seawall, rock, seawall, rock. I mean, so this is, you know, essentially kind of where we're going um, with the state of the engineering science the, the way it is. Um, I wanted to show a few other things, how they look. I mean, we talk about seawalls, flood walls, but they have aesthetic impacts. Um, and this is all a wall. This is what they're doing on the New Jersey shoreline post Sandy. In fact, I love this article. It just came out. This is a, the city just got $40 million to build a seawall. But what's funny in the article, they're all excited. Wouldn't it be great to drive the metal in by the first anniversary? And 16 feet above the beach, 32 feet below. Um, so that's kind of where we're going. Uh, now, we don't have hurricanes here and such, so we're not, this is more dramatic than us, but we, um, we'll see, we're going to see more and more um, 
push from private individuals who own a lot of our shoreline to protect their resources. This is kind of what we think, what the um, planning efforts really need to get in front of. Um, tide gates, something I'll talk about here in a sec. Tide gates can help block off the tides. They, you see them all, all talked about. But how do they look? You know, they're not the most beautiful things. And they have impacts ecologically and, and also we talk about putting tide gate structures, which I think in some places we should. Um, it's also really hard to permit. Um, so these are whole other topics, but just trying to make a little more visual what some of these engineer options really look like. And I think uh, Christina's gonna probably even do more of this from Europe. So I'm gonna close to the adaptation part talking. We've been really spending a lot of time in the um, Richardson Bay part of the shoreline, because this is where we have existing flooding, even now, based on high tide. So that's from the King Tide of 2012. Miller Avenue, um, it's just a backwater on a nice sunny day, or <laughs> so we don't get a lot of drainage down there. It's a real problem. Um, and then when you add in the rain, immense, you easily get that's from the old days. But, you, know, <laughs> you can see this more and more houseboats, so to speak, flood boats. Um, and so we get flooding from both ends. We have impacts to everything. It's a really nice. Uh, I mean, if you're a flood engineer, it's very nice, I should say. <laughs> um, it's a really nice laboratory for sea level rise adaptation planning. Can we as a community really come together and, and, and really do it? So I think it's a good spot to do it because it's more confined. And, and, um, and we have two big projects, the one Sarah talked about and around Rambuburu Beach. So I've been trying to get grant funding and in a sense, RIN is really ground central in a lot of ways for adaptation planning. What's happening now is sort of, I call it a mini art or art junior, Sarah's project, uh, the BCDC project. There's a supervisor, Kate Sear Citizen Task Force of which Phyllis Faber, our famous local ecologist, is part of a really impressive group of people, um, citizens coming together to help um, you know, do adaptation planning for, for, for that area. Uh, it's really led also by the Marin Community Development. Um, Jack Lipser's here, so the planning folks are really working hand in hand with the community. And then people like me in flood control and BCDC were kind of there as needed to help out and um, sort of support the process. And so we're not doing, I think Sarah's point was that, you know, art is a big process, you know, it's, but it's made to be defined and used by the local community. So there's parts of arts that we don't really, it's not as applicable for Marin, but so we're trying to take it and run with it, the parts that make sense. So now we're back to adaptation strategies. We talked a little about these. This is the whole host, and it's, it's a, probably for another day to go over each of these in some detail. But... Um, um, we have the hard solutions, sort of the engineered ones. I showed you levees and walls and riprap and the soft ones, beaches and wetlands. And T-zone is transition zone. That's a wetlands habitat type Sarah mentioned. Um, and then there's all sorts of other ones. I'll just go to a few um, slides here on, you know, things we can do, sort of adaptation, lifestyle adaptations. Um, oh, before I get to that, I'll say I wanted to, like, part of the Richardson Bay is we're actually starting to draw lines on the ground to look at what it would take if we don't do to protect homes. So, so this is kind of you create, if we have to build levees, we're starting to lay out levees along the shoreline and, and make decisions about where we want to uh, hold the line against direct coastal inundation. So we're very early in this process. But do we want to try to defend the pathway um, or do we want to you know, let the pathway, let nature take its course, maybe build up the marshes and build our coastal defenses, so to speak, um, back here? Um, and then we're starting to add things up and say, okay, if we build levees, we have alignments, we have, we might need miles of levee where if we can put in a, a tide gate at the mouth here, we reduce the miles of levee down quite a bit. So this is just giving you kind of an impression of the thinking um, that we're doing in flood control with the uh, task force about how to approach. And then we're, we're trying to make these barriers real, the miles, um, with the goal of starting to put cost to them too. So these are just typical costs for levee construction and you start getting for new levees, you know, it could easily be $1,000 a foot. So you start adding up miles of levee, um, you know, you start talking a lot of money. And one thing Kate Sear said recently, which I agree with, is that, uh, you know, we probably shouldn't be looking, like, for post-Sandy federal money in the future, because there really isn't probably going to be it. And that Florida itself, she said, where she put it, could suck every dollar in the U.S. economy for this, because the challenges are so big. So, so we may, in the end, be looking for local grants and local funding. And when you start adding these up and putting them on paper, um, the numbers actually start looking pretty big. So we should, planning, this needs to be a factor in planning. That's what really focuses a lot of what I'm doing. So then there's some lifestyle adaptation um, that the landscape architects tend to need. <laughs> and this is a, this actually existing, I think it's on Lagos or something in Nigeria where a lot of poor people live on boats. This is from the uh, houseboat days, which I 
I wasn't around so much then, but I heard it was a pretty good party in the 60s. <laughs> I was going to house boat scene. Still there, yeah, in Old Alley, so I wouldn't mind going back to those. Uh, the next one goes on higher. Um, there's uh, all sorts of ideas out there from the creative, young landscape architects envisioning the future, I guess aquatic teepees or something like that. So, um, this is something I think in actually Qatar or something in the desert where this is actually the hydropolis design where people sort of live with the nature and water. And this is one somebody put together in the BCDC contest they had a few years back. This is actually the mouth of Puerto Madera Creek where uh, people will be farming and I guess, I don't know if they're watering with salt water or not, but, <laughs> um, but they're living at the, at the mouth. So how many of these are real or all? But you'll see as you, you know, envision this world, there's a lot of creativity and it's an interesting time actually as we think, well, what could work? And so we, it's kind of fun to look at some of these and envision. And so actually, Somebody handed me a card recently where they, their title was Futurist, which I thought was very cool, because they're just walking around and thinking about the future. Um, and so finally, I'm going to, uh, well, actually, a couple more things, but uh, you hear a lot about the Dutch alternative, and Christina's going to talk about it in some real form. I'm making more joke here. But BCDC signed a partnership with the Dutch. That was in 2011. LA River had a big day of adaptation to climate change with the Dutch. Um, and, you know, uh, and the Dutch tend, you know, I'm being simplistic here, it, it's sort of Northo European Germanic approach is very much of a, um, you know, a more engineered, uh, maybe somewhat control of nature, although I'm sure they'll, Christina will correct this, but, you know, they, they tend to use big structures, uh, and a lot of, they've diked off every inlet and pushed structures across it, so they've invested heavily in engineering, um, and it's really the truth, in a way that I don't think currently we can here, given all our other multi-objective needs for habitat and all. So the permitting agencies won't let these be happening across every dike and bay, and creek, and Golden Gate. But, um, but I say, you know, the other approach is <laughs> straight up Dutch. We can also learn from the Italians to maybe live with sea level rise a little bit. <laughs> so there's one, two. So you can still hang out with your friends. Um, you can still do sports. People do. In fact, you can, uh, yeah, uh, pretty amazing. And then actually, you can, you can even try new sports, ones I didn't know about, sort of urban diving, aquatic diving. <laughs> And then the Italians did early research into uh, <laughs> love, the impacts of love and romance on a rising sea level, I think, in the fountains. This is uh, La Dolce Vita, of course. So. Um, and then you still see that even going on today in some photos. So, so, you know, so this other adaptation is to learn to live a little bit with a little bit of, of water on the ground. Um, and then finally, that brings us to maybe the, the hardest part that we've, talked, we've touched upon, really, the engineering adaptation. But then there's the process. And how do we work together and plan and this, by far and away, is the most difficult thing. Because although we like to think it's, it's a rational discussion at times, often, it won't be news to people in Marin, it's not always so rational. And we get, you know, you want to build walls? No way. Or you want to install gates to hurt fish? No way. And you want to save birds and I have to pay flood insurance? No way. And you want to save the Mill Valley Dog Park? No way. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And it's tough, because that's all, the discourse often goes this way. And, and that cat, that, that, the cactus hates dogs, and there was no, way, there was no breaking through. But our goal, it seems like what we have to do is we're always trying to get to this goal of win-win um, and you know, you, uh, group hug sort of things. And that may, it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds over the next years, because this is really the, uh, probably the main challenge. Um, oh, right, this is, a, this is from the King Tide again to everybody biking, so starting their adaptation training already. But the takeaway is... Um, I'll start with this uh, three, because this, like, we're going to talk about planning. You know, we're, uh, sea level rise has been called a, a slow-moving catastrophe. And as such, it's good and that we have time and that it's bad and that I don't think we're very good at planning for things that move slowly. Yeah. So how we do that and how that unfolds over the next years, I hope I live long enough to see it successful. Um, but it's comprehensive planning, I think, is really a, a good thing. We're not talking now about building walls or sea gates. I mean, we're not at that point. We have some chronic flooding areas like Manzanita parking lot and Miller Avenue that we need to deal with. But, but we need to start thinking about what we want it to look like, where we're going to draw the line, so to speak, and start making, maybe making sure we have the right of way or we don't let properties get away that are key, critical to making that happen. You know, a barrier is only as strong as its weakest link. So we need to start you know, planning out how we think this is going to go and that we want habitat and how we're going to maintain it, like Phil said, using sediment connecting the watershed sediment to the bay. So these are big decisions that we have time now to do if we can really get started on the road. Um, we need to know our sites, so it's very, it needs to be locally driven. 
and uh, like Sarah said, this should be done on triggers of sea level rise, not just timelines of when it happens. But um, we know really, uh, it really is coming, and we see the effects already. And um, our goal now is to sort of get out in front of it. And that's it. This is a view of the uh, Richardson Bay, Mill Valley watershed before all those people got involved. Um, and, uh, that's it. Maybe it's something good to Christina. We're a little ahead of schedule, so I think we're going to take a 10-minute break. Um, the bathrooms are out in the back, and then we'll come back and we'll hear from Christina Hill. But before you leave, um, I would like to acknowledge my co-coordinator, who really didn't get introduced and who's back doing the slides. Uh, Sandy Goldman has been a delight to work with. I think she's still currently the friends of Corte Madera Creek. Is that right? And you're a biologist? Geologist, so she knows a lot about these issues and she's been delightful to work with and certainly this has been an equal collaboration. Thanks, Andrew. Next up on our agenda is Christina Hill and Christina is an associate professor at the University of California at Berkeley. She's currently focusing on developing proposals for urban adaptation to climate change in the San Francisco Bay Area. She co-edited co and authored the book Ecology and Design Frameworks for Learning uh, on, out by Island Press in 2002 and has published numerous book chapters and articles in scientific and professional journals. Some of uh, the articles we did have up on our website, they were very informative. <coughs> Christina lectures internationally on ecology and design and is currently working on a book about urban adaptation to sea level rise and flooding for Springer's, for Springer publishers. Her research and consulting work has been funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation and clients in the U.S. and abroad. Her most recent professional project was a water management strategy for Greater New Orleans where she advised a team of designers and engineers on site and system design. She received a Master of Landscape Architecture with distinction from Harvard's University Graduate School of Design and a Doctor of Philosophy in Landscape Architecture with a minor in Ecology from Harvard University. Um, Christine is going to be speaking to us today about uh, mostly European examples, um, some approaches taken in Holland, Britain, and Germany. And she's going to cover us on the Japanese approach of the super dike. Um, she's also going to talk to us about some US East Coast examples and connect them to the horizontal levee idea we've been hearing in the Bay Area. And I'm happy to say that she's had four of her students come with her. Um, so I'm happy to have them here and welcome them. And they hopefully will be the brains designing some of these new adaptations. So here we have Christina Hill. Thank you. So um, I'm going to move kind of quickly through a bunch of images, which is more the way in my field. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is give you an overview of what people are doing in different parts of the world who have already begun this process and have invested a lot of resources in it. And I'll talk a little bit about that investment of resources, which I think is an important issue and one that's harder for people to talk about from public agencies. Um, but something, since I don't have a boss, I actually can talk about whatever I want. And, uh, <laughs> the money issue comes up. Um, I just wanted to point out, from a long-term perspective, my, my uh, original degree is actually in geology. And uh, images like this that describe the history, um, that show the history over 20 plus thousand years of sea rates of sea level rise, shows us that we've had lots of periods in the past, after the glaciers, of rapid sea level rise. And what's actually exceptional is this long period of low rate of sea level rise. The last eight or 9,000 years is weird in relation to the last 20,000 years. And that weirdness coincides with the time about seven, five to 7,000 years ago when we first started to build cities. We as human beings first started to live in cities on the coast during a time of much lower rates of sea level rise globally. And uh, we've never had to manage cities during a period of rapid sea level rise, mm -hmm. even though that's been typical for 
uh, coastal conditions over the last 20,000 years. So we have a whole new situation that we're get, we've gotten ourselves into, and uh, cities are relatively new in geologic time, so hopefully we'll be able to figure out a way to do this. It's also important to remember, I think, as Roger pointed out, this is recent um, modeling work by, the, uh, by NOAA from 2013, uh, showing how pre precipitation is going to increase, or is predicted to increase, in most parts of the, uh, the world, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. And this uh, color chart is showing us the percent by which the maximum precipitation event may increase. <coughs> so all this dark green is 30% plus precipitation in the maximum event. So at the same time we're talking about sea level rising, we're talking about potentially very large changes in how much water comes with big rainstorm events. And that land and sea combination is really what creates the challenge at the coast. Um, I can tell you about a couple things that don't work well, so that hopefully you could not do them. <laughs> and this is from my work in New Orleans and my work on, in the US uh, Virginia coast, um, Virginia and North Carolina. Uh, abandoning structures in the intertidal zone. This has become a kind of common thing in the Chesapeake Bay Islands where uh, subsidence of the land, the land is sinking at the same time the sea has been rising, has created some really challenging situations. And uh, building concrete flood walls on top of earth and levees in New Orleans um, is a strategy we're hearing people talk about now around the United States. Uh, both of them are pretty bad. I'll show you some images that help me explain why. But the piece of what we're looking for in strategies people are using around the world is multifunctionality. Because as we think about multifunctionality, we can think about the value of the investment in a broader way. Um, if we think about just, if we, I'll talk uh, shortly about how people um, value things with things like net present value, which some of you may have heard of. But uh, if we value the benefits of our structures across multiple issues, recreational benefits, tourism benefits, um, ecosystem services, benefits and not just the flood prevention benefit, then we can see how doing some of this earlier makes financial sense. If we talk about it only in terms of avoiding flood damage, then we wait until the actual flood events come to spend the money because we can't justify spending it today. So it's very important to look for multifunctionality. And as the Dutch say, to look at quality of life, to think about living with water as part of quality of life and improving the uh, suitability of your city for investment by international investors, not just <clears throat> thinking about preventing a disaster. So uh, retreat with ruins is basically currently the East Coast strategy, although uh, New Jersey and New York are starting to think about what else they could do. The, the real drag of this strategy is that uh, not only do people lose the use of these homes, they're usually uh, vacation homes, but they had to actually, um, they, well they lose the long-term benefit of not being able to pass on the value of the second home to their children, but they also uh, had to pay to remove these structures eventually once they were in the intertidal zone. So there's a lot of cost for the homeowner in the abandonment strategy um, if the state and federal agencies hold the line and say, you're responsible for that structure. Um, and this is a New Orleans shot, a famous one by Mario Tema, a photographer. And it shows how, it, I think it's actually a stage shot. I don't know how these girls got up on that flood wall. <laughs> um, it seems unlikely to me. But whatever, they are up on the flood wall. And they're up on the flood wall because that's the only way you can see the water in New Orleans. People live behind these walls and they forget the world that they depend on outside those walls. Their safety depends on understanding the water, but the water is all outside the walls. So it's like living in a medieval city and trying to understand international trade. If you're behind a wall, you don't learn what's going on. And uh, unfortunately, the boxed-in strategy is the one that a lot of people are recommending based on today's technologies. Um, if you go to the engineers, you will typically get an idea like this, not to trade back with Roger about landscape architects and engineers, but that is the fact. Uh, the Netherlands, what they've been doing that's been really good has been uh, city scale and regional scale water plans. They have a national water plan called the, um, the Delta Commission plan and they have plans for cities. You can see on this one for Rotterdam they're already at version 2.0. Uh, New Orleans has, we just did the very first one for New Orleans 
and there aren't many that exist for American cities in general, that look at all of the water systems. This is the beauty of the Dutch approach, is that they are looking now at uh, river flooding, local rain. Of course, river flooding for the Dutch means a rainstorm that happens in the Czech Republic. Um, ra local rain that happens actually over the city or near the city, uh, groundwater being pushed up by a rising sea level, and then the rising sea level. And it's these four directions of rain that we all have to think about. How does our infrastructure work as the groundwater table rises? How do we deal with flooding that comes from upstream? Um, not so much an issue for Marin County, but definitely an issue for other parts of the bay that are, for example, affected by delta flooding in the California delta. Uh, Rotterdam is a city that started out really teeny and grew like a big gooey duck because the boats kept getting bigger and bigger that come into the harbor. So this is the old harbor of Rotterdam, and these are all the old harbors of Rotterdam, <laughs> all abandoned, and this is the current harbor of Rotterdam continually being enlarged because the boats are so big now, uh, they can't get them into this area. So what they're doing there is uh, building levees all along the edge. They have levees, they're already, they already exist, all along this edge. They have dams all upstream, there are a number of those here on this diagram, that prevent floods from upstream from bringing debris and waves, wave energy to the city. And then they have a barrier right here, right there, a movable mechanical barrier that I'll show you on the edge. So the way they manage the flooding is to use a whole bunch of barriers to ensure, this is the um, maislot carrying that uh, Roger showed, it's hydraulically uh, it's like the, the, the length of these triangles are like the height of the Eiffel Tower. And they rotate into place on a track in the, in the bed of the river. And then they drop into place in the center in this position. And of course, they only work in extreme events. So it's not an everyday strategy. It's a strategy for extreme events. Otherwise, there'd be no shipping up and down this river. And they want that shipping to occur still. So this is the movable tide gate is a strategy for preventing extreme events from causing flooding. It's not a strategy for keeping out everyday uh, water. And of course, as a result, it only works for a certain period of time. If the extreme event's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, then eventually it won't work uh, for those extreme events. It'll be a regular strategy, not an extreme strategy. And this is actually a great story in a way because uh, they built this in 97. Picture this happening in the United States. They plan ahead. They spend a couple billion dollars. <laughs> they build this innovative thing that no one has ever built before based on their own local design. The people who are in charge of it get credit for that as a positive thing that they've spent this money. They don't need to use it for 10 years. Those people are still allowed to live in the Netherlands. <laughs> and it wasn't needed for 10, picture that in the United States in our political cycles. What would happen to those people? <laughs> Because the Dutch have prevented flooding from bringing in debris and wave energy, and the water just rises and falls in a pretty quiescent way, um, they can build floating buildings. And this is their first prototype, a floating conference center in, in one of the old harbors of Rotterdam, for what they plan to build as floating urban blocks. And then they will come here and they will sell those technologies to us. <laughs> So that's what's coming. You'll soon be hearing from the Dutch about how they can build you a floating block once you've prepared the environment. Not just houseboats anymore, but parks and commercial areas, multiple use, the whole thing on floating blocks. And this is an example of the Dutch um, living in a flood management pond. This is a berm and a levee behind that. There's another berm on this edge that goes all the way down here. This woman's house is in a wet pond. It always has about this much water in it, and in a major storm event, it could get three, four more feet of water stored in that pond. Her house is on stilts, on piles. So she gets to enjoy living by the water all the time. Her front door is on a levee over here, and her vehicle access to her house is on that levee. But uh, this also functions to store a lot of cubic yards of water when it needs to. The Dutch have been not only building uh, wet ponds you can live in, but also, and that's high-end <coughs> housing, by the way, um, but also moving the levees back around their rivers to allow more uh, flood capacity in a very you know, diagrammatic, goofy representation of what that would look like in this particular slide. 
But that's an important question too. And building levees along rivers is now seen as going backwards by the Dutch. The trick is to move the levees back away from rivers because the precipitation events have already been so extreme. The other uh, really cool thing they've done and piloted, which relates to the um, Aramburu Island project that Roger talked about, is something called the sand engine or zandmotor in Dutch. Here's Rotterdam. Here's that big gooey duck neck out to the harbor. Here's the Dutch sand coast. Um, a lot of people would have said and did say in the 1980s that if sea level rises the way we think it's going to, the Dutch are going to have to move to Germany. <laughs> this is not a starting point for a conversation in the Netherlands. <laughs> not okay. So instead of talking about moving people who are living 45% of the country um, under sea level already, what they're talking about is permanently widening the sand coast, which means in a kind of Sisyphean way, widening that sand coast, using dredge material from here on the continental shelf all the time. That's their commitment. And uh, they do that in fun ways, interesting ways, but their latest strategy is to build a feature, um, which is essentially a sandy uh, delta, a sand spit, but Roger talked about what, five to 6,000 cubic yards of sand for the beach restoration? 28 million cubic yards of sand. And the Dutch call it building with nature uh, because they are imitating the glacier as their version of nature, which we've lost, which did these big pulses of sand out to the coast and provided the Dutch with their incredible resource of sand. They're not imitating today's nature, they're imitating um, geological nature of a longer time period. And using this technology of uh, what they call rainbowing, what we sometimes call side casting, they've been able to build this big thing, the sand motor, sand engine, pretty cheaply. In fact, the Dutch are famous for their thrift and uh, the structure that they've built here with 28 million cubic yards of sand, they think is going to nourish um, about nine miles, six to nine miles of coast, widen the beach through wave action over six to nine miles of coast as this lump spreads out north and south and that if that works, if it nourishes that much coastline, it'll cost 25% what traditional annual beach nourishment costs because there's almost no labor involved in putting this big lump of sand out. There's labor there, but it's cheaper to put the sand in deeper water. So when you get off the beach itself to do your nourishment, you're not just using uh, pipes with slurry in them and bulldozers and dump trucks. And you get out to uh, between more, more than three feet of water down to nine feet of water, they use side casting or the rainbowing. And beyond that, they use a kind of a, a waterborne dump truck where they just open the bay and drop sand um, onto the floor. So it's much cheaper to do it that way. And if the Dutch can prove that it's cheaper, that'll be interesting for all of us. Mm -hmm. This is the edge of that sand engine already moving just three months after they placed the sand. Uh, it's, it was here and now it's getting a nose moving towards the shore. The big benefits for the Dutch have been, and this is this multi-benefit issue, have been that they are getting much more recreation. They've created the best point break in Northern Europe. <laughs> uh, they're getting kite surfers and board surfers and all kinds of things that have extended the recreational season and are bringing more tourist dollars to that area. And they're getting better habitat benefits because they don't drive bulldozers over the beach every year. So they're getting animals coming back they haven't seen for a long time, like the Eurasian spoonbill. They're getting plants coming back because these plants can't establish themselves when the sand is being disturbed every year. So now they're talking about being able to get growth like this over a 10 to 15 year period and then start the process over again with a new uh, sand egg. And the whole idea is that you have to give up the idea of preserving what the shape of the coastline is and embrace the dynamics of it. If a group formed called Friends of the Sand Engine that tried to stop it from eroding, that would be a problem. <laughs> we have to embrace the idea of processes changing dramatically what the beach size is and what the shoreline processes are. Uh, the Japanese superdike. I mentioned this one because this is the only group and idea that the Dutch admire outside of their own <laughs> sphere. <laughs> and it is interesting, and it's done in a seismic region. This is in Osaka in Japan. And the normal dike they have in Osaka is about 30 feet tall. It looks much bigger because the buildings here are a little bit out of scale. It's a 30-foot tall dike. 
and it's uh, not that wide, maybe, I don't know, 200 feet wide, 150 feet wide. This is the river on this side. The super dike has the same height, but it has a width of about 1,200 feet. So it's become a topographic ridge, essentially. And uh, they have a lot of gravel to use in Japan because the mountains are, are eroding into this river, so there's a lot of coarse material available. And they built this with a combination of sand, gravel, and clay. Um, and what they did was extend everyone's property lines right up through the new material. Mm -hmm. And then people consolidated and sold to developers. And now, because this is so large, it can't fail the way a traditional levee can fail. Um, so you can put infrastructure pipes in it, you can put buildings on it, you can put roads on it, you can plant trees on it, which you can't do with a traditional earthen levee because any uh, crack or opening in the levee itself is cause for much alarm because water could follow that crack from a dead root or something else. So this is a very interesting strategy. And they financed this during a period of recession because interest rates were low. So this is a kind of public works project. The Japanese put a lot of people to work in the 1990s building these super dikes uh, during a time when borrowing would be cheap. This is what it looks like in a photograph. It's kind of hard to see because we're looking at it from above. But it has a lot of potential to function as a public landscape. This is one that's being proposed for Taipei and Taiwan, where they currently have a flood wall 20 feet high running along a highway. And the proposal is to make that flood wall interact more with a super levee, super dike, and make that super dike into a park. So it's an idea for a public landscape that would be uh, function as storm protection. And they have to plan for the tsunami wave, a very large tsunami wave, as well as typhoons. Um, and that's actually an interesting problem that uh, I'll talk more about just in a second, which is that the extremes are driving the response. As we saw the steel flood wall in New Jersey, if you live in a region, and most regions of the world have this problem, where hurricanes and typhoons can come in with a 30-foot high wall of water. You plan for that, and three to six feet of sea level rise doesn't sound like that big a deal. In New Orleans, you actually cannot have a conversation about sea level rise, because people think three feet, six feet, no big deal. They're talking about 30 feet, and they know it's going to happen, again, in their lifetimes. So when you work in an environment with extremes, you end up having to plan and deal with those extremes all the time. In the Bay Area, we have a very special opportunity to look at this as an incremental process. We are better off than most of the United States. That's actually why I would argue we're not going to get federal money. Mm -hmm. Because those disasters are going to over and over again drive the federal response. And it's going to be tough to abandon New York City. So they're going to get money over and over again, and the West Coast is not going to get much money from the federal government. It's going to look relatively good. Um, let me tell you briefly about this Hamburg situation, it, which is that they have a port in the city, um, about 140 kilometers, or what's that, 80 miles from the North Sea. And they want to bring these very deep boats in, um, so they keep that river open. And as a result of all the dredging on this river, partly. They get very big floods, the St. Pauli um, <coughs> in Humber. And you can see the floating walkways are going up from the land because the water level is so much higher. About 10 feet of flooding in this fish market building here. And most of the city is up on a bluff. Um, this is the, it's not really, it's part levee and part natural um, escarpment. And the warehouse district that used to go with the port is now not used because we don't package and unpackage things at ports anymore. We just unload containers and put them on trains. So this has been redeveloped as housing, um, and it's down in the flood zone. So they tried to figure out some way to do it, and they basically hired a Dutch urban designer who said, uh, let's put these buildings all up on a pile of dirt. So we'll pile up compacted earth underneath them. We'll put parking garages on the first floor instead of residences and commercial uses and we'll build a seawall all along the edge. And uh, that hardened for story functions as a floodable environment. Give this a look. Uh, here's the walk public uh, walkway. We normally in urban design would not appreciate having a first floor that has no windows and nothing to look at. But in this environment, you hardly notice because you're looking out at the water all the time. But watch this slide and what happens to the water. Here's low tide in Hamburg. Here's high tide in Hamburg. So it's all still in the face of that seawall. Here's the storm flood, and it's halfway up the first floor. But it's all been hardened and designed for that. 
So the uh, parking garages on the parks, here's an image of the park. Um, these are floating parks, floating beaches in some areas. People hang out on towels and float up and down attached to pylons. This is a hardened park, all, most all concrete, because the storm flood comes in with waves and with woody debris. So it has to be hardened to accept that. Pretty dramatic. And they have um, gasket-lined parking garages underneath here. So when the flood comes, there's a warning. They know about 24 to 72 hours in advance. The warning goes out, and you have to remember to put your car in the parking garage. Um, and there's an emergency walkway at uh, 20 plus feet above the street, and that's how people get around <coughs> when it floods. But the whole development is designed to be livable when it is flooded. So it's at the point where people don't evacuate, they bring the kids down <laughs> to check it out. And occasionally somebody, there's a little car over here, somebody might forget to put their car in the garage because they're in Malaga, and that's their problem. <laughs> but people here are adapting to the floods by being aware of them. This is the exact opposite of the New Orleans strategy of living in a box behind the walls and not being aware of the water at all. And I think that has a lot to offer us. In the United Kingdom, I just want to show a quick example of, I'm sorry, this is uh, London here. I'm so used to looking at it. This is um, Isle of Dogs, Canary Wharf. This is central historic London, and this is the greater London area. In the East London Green Grid project, here's the central London and central city area, and the Isle of Dogs, Canary Wharf, and the Thames River flowing out to the channel. They have taken all the tributary valleys and purchased this land. Almost all this land shown here in color has been purchased by the public to provide uh, storage for extreme rain events as a way of managing the flooding in London. They have a floodgate at the end of every one of these tributaries. And they manage all of these little floodgates along with the big uh, Thames barrier as a system, which is very complicated. This is the Thames barrier here. It looks like silver slippers, but uh, it actually, I think I had a slide of um, what that looks like from the side. And of course, it won an award from the stainless steel people. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing about it is that it actually kind of looks like a helmet. And aesthetically, it suggests to people who have seen the archaeological <coughs> uh, products from Sutton Hoo and other places, a kind of 8th century Anglo-Saxon warrior helmet. <laughs> and that's a great way to tap people's deeper cultural associations instead of just building a big wall out of concrete. It's a very interesting design in that way. <coughs> but what I wanted to show you is what Sarah kind of showed us. If you arrange strategies based on sea level uh, possible levels, and then you think about it as a flow chart and how you would move through it to get to having your system ready for different sea levels, it avoids the whole conversation about when is this new sea level going to happen, which gets us bogged down. So in that sense, it's really good to be able to show people that there are ways to get to two meters, um, following a pathway through this. We could think about taking this path through and making those changes, and we can assign a dollar figure to each pathway. And think about which is more expensive and less expensive, and what we would do at what point in time. And I call this the just-in-time borrowing or funding method. And it sounds good to the British, they've adopted it, they think that this is an appropriate thing to borrow when you need it. But I have to say, when they need it, we will need it. Florida will need it. Thailand will need it. India will need it. Everybody will need it. So when people are borrowing money and everyone's borrowing at the same time, you know interest rates go up. So this is a very expensive strategy when you think about it because it's not just happening in the UK. When they get to two meters, we'll all be at two meters. Everyone's going to need the same resources. So the cost of borrowing will go way up. In that sense, the, um, the strategy for how you borrow is very important, if you're borrowing. Um, let me close by just pointing out a few different strategies for how people around the world have been financing these things. Um, this just-in-time idea is something that the British have adopted. They didn't do it before. Uh, they are proposing it now, so we adapt it. Uh, the well in advance borrowing at low interest rates, that's what the Dutch have done, that's what the Japanese did. They borrow when there's a global recession. 
And so their cost to pay off the project over 30, 40 years is much lower. Uh, East London Green Grid also was, there was borrowing done during a recession and that's how they uh, captured all that land. The rainy day savings approach is one that um, I'm sort of reporting on second hand. I've heard um, a colleague, Dilla Trevetti, from Moffat and Nickel, who's consulted on Treasure Island here in the Bay, talk about this strategy. So I've listed Treasure Island. The basic idea is just that as developers develop an area on the coast, they put money into a rainy day fund, which collects interest, and then when you need to do uh, a change to prevent flooding, you have a fund that's available of your own to spend on that flooding. And that's a different idea. You don't have to borrow. You're saving for the future, not borrowing when money is expensive to borrow. So that's a reasonable thing to do. It's hard politically. But in that case, they did it. And I'm sure the developers are probably thinking in the back of their mind, it's a rainy day fund. We could use it for lots of possible things. <laughs> <laughs> and who knows if it will still be there in 2050 or 2030 when they need it. And then the debt capacity timing. Um, this is something that I've had a lot of personal experience with uh, in terms of public projects. And uh, it's very important to consider whether the debt we take on today for infrastructure projects is um, going to be something we have to continue to pay off when that infrastructure project is no longer suited for the environment that it's in. Are you paying for that bridge that was raised to adapt a highway to sea level rise into the decade when that bridge is no longer high enough? Because if you are, you have no headroom to borrow again. So timing of debt and timing of useful life of a project are very important. It's going to be tricky. So basically, we should pay more now and have less of that carried over by future generations. Because if they have our debt and they have to adapt with their own money, that's going to be very difficult to pay for. Um, I do, I'm a big believer in borrowing when money is cheap. But I think we have to look at the term of the borrowing. And then uh, the question about how we value the investments. Most of what you'll see is people talking about uh, cost-benefit comparisons, um, where the cost of the project is weighed against the annual event-based flood damage cost. So as much as people could expect over a 20-year period, what the damages might be annually um, averaged over that time, and then compared to the cost of the, whatever it is, the levy or the levy plus marsh or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, that sees the benefit as just avoided flood damage. So it's a very narrow way to look at the problem. The benefit could also be seen as total value of property and infrastructure. And that's what they're doing in London. They talk about the total value of all the real estate in central London as justifying the thing as they do on the Thames system. Because that real estate would be not useful if it was underwater. So they're saying, let's take total value, not just annual flood damages. The other one, which has been used here in the Bay Area and is being recommended all around the world now by the World Bank, is that we use a net present value approach. And the net present value approach just looks at, compares the cost of the project today to whatever those annual future benefits are, but discounted by 5% or 7% or 4%. And it's discounted because what they're saying to you is, if you had put that money for that flood control project into a savings account, then you would have interest on that money over a period of time. And it's more, it's smarter to get the interest on that money and uh, put it in the bank today than it is to um, spend it today on a flood control project and not have the interest accrue over time. So that's basically a net present value approach. I don't think it applies as much to government spending myself. Because I don't see all that money sitting in a bank somewhere <laughs> <laughs> accumulating interest. So I'm not sure it really applies on the public sector side in the same way. On the private sector side, sure, developers borrow money. He or she has to think about what to do with that money. If they could collect interest on it and then spend it only just in time, that would make some sense. But what they don't do in these, in these net present value assessments, typically, is think about the multiple benefits. What are the ecosystem service benefits of the marsh? What are the uh, benefits of recreation? What are the dollars brought in by tourism? What are the willingness to pay contingent benefits of people who love the shoreline and spend every day walking and jogging along it? So we have to ask ourselves a wider spectrum of what are our values 
And that wider spectrum typically leads us to different solutions. If we include ecosystem services, recreation, cultural benefits, we tend to see a dip, we will see a potentially radically different evaluation of project alternatives. <clears throat> the World Bank is basically saying you, you should do the thing that has the net, highest net present value. Done. It's problem solved. Uh, but how you calculate that present value can be myopic or it can be multi-spectrum and more holistic. The horizontal levy proposal that the Bay Institute has been putting out with support from consultants like ESA, PWA, um, is basically to say, let's have a levy, okay, let's accept the idea of a levy for a lot of the day, and let's put this marsh on the outside. And it looks a lot like what Sarah was showing for the uh, marsh restoration project, where there's an idea about distributing water fresh water at the top and making a freshwater, saltwater marsh in between and absorbing wave energy. And they're making some of the very same arguments that she made for this to be able to promote the idea of building marshes everywhere. I just want to point out one thing that I don't hear discussed that much, which is that if you build a levee of any kind, with any kind of marsh on the bay side, what do you have to do on the land side? You have to pump. You have to pump forever. Once you decide to go with a levee or a, a, a flood wall, something which is a permanent barrier that doesn't allow water out, you have to pump. There go all your carbon emissions targets right there with the energy required for pumping, unless you can mobilize through it with biogas, like the East Bay mud treatment plant provides itself with energy from biogas, or do it through maybe PV. I don't know how much PV that would take. You'd have PV all over this whole landscape here. <laughs> to be able to make that work, I think. Um, but right, that, that means that every pipe that carries rainwater or treated sewage water to the bay would have to have a pump. Or we'd have to collect them all at key points and pump over. And that means the pipe has to go over. Because <laughs> you can't have a pipe come through the levee unless you do the super deck. And then you can have things penetrate the super deck because it's so big it can't collapse. So there are a lot of contingencies here and important things to think about. Pumping is an ad infinitum commitment in this kind of context. And then the cost things that they, the estimates they published for the Bay Institute, uh, they looked at costs in a broader way and they valued uh, the benefits of the marshes in, that, in the study that they put out. But I, you know, I recommend it to people to look at. Uh, the full study is, um, it is interesting in how they did it. I don't know how standard those methods are, but I think that it's compelling in some ways. <coughs> They're talking about the cost of a traditional levy per mile. Roger had numbers per foot, per linear foot. But per mile, 12 and a half million, and a tidal marsh with an earthen levy at six and a quarter, and um, the earthen levy with marsh at uh, six and two thirds. So if we look at the net present value in relation to those costs, <coughs> and we look at it across a wide spectrum of benefits, it would lead us to choose something from a financial perspective, like the horizontal levy plus the, the interior levy. And that doesn't include the pumping costs. But all of these have the pumping costs hidden underneath the number that's related to constructing <laughs> the levy itself. So in the absence of a major federal funding effort, uh, there are some serious questions communities have to ask themselves about what to do. And maybe that's why uh, we've seen on the East Coast a tendency towards abandonment in the Southeast, Virginia and North Carolina, because no one has been able to mobilize property owners, of, especially vacation homes, to come <coughs> together and come up with a better strategy. Um, and the only state I know of that's doing something cool uh, in terms of institutional changes is the state of Maryland, which is considering a shoreline utility, like a water utility or a waste or an energy utility, and creating a new piece of government that's supposed to pay attention to the shoreline as a multifunctional benefit, and manage that benefit. And I personally would like to see BCDC expanded in the Bay, in terms of its scope and powers, to be able to do more of this, um, not just manage things related to access to the shoreline, but actually be the shoreline utility. And they don't pay me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that makes a lot of sense because BCDC already has the reach. But I'm still new to the area, so I can make mistakes. Uh, would that give them taxing you know, power? Not necessarily. 
Not at all, necessarily, but it could be something that they would have authority to do. Somebody is going to have to raise money. And with, what is it, nine counties around the Bay? And a, a very quickly growing urban area in the South Bay? Um, we have to figure out how to tap growth in this area to provide what we need, which is a 200-year viable shoreline. We need the 200-year plan for the shoreline with changes that are hard for human beings to visualize. There, I remember hearing a lecture when I was a student that was by a famous ecologist, and he was saying, the hardest thing for humans to get is an exponential change. <laughs> because in the beginning, it looks linear. It looks like what you see now. And then the rate starts to shift as the curve starts to go up. And then all of a sudden, it seems like a disaster has happened overnight. But meanwhile, it's been coming all that time. We know it's coming. Um, I actually thought that the extreme part of the curve, where, where it leaves the linear trend, is already happening right now. So if I were planning a 200 year shoreline, I would be looking at some pretty big numbers. When people stop those models, with that shape of the curve getting steep out at the end like that, when people stop their models at 2100, what's going to happen in 2110? <laughs> it's going to be a lot higher. So we have to think about more of a 200 year frame for this. I think. That's a totally reasonable thing to do with infrastructure, with trains, with bridges. Night before last, Marin Democratic Party passed a resolution supporting a potential nine county Bay Area parcel tax uh, for mainly, I understand, wetlands preservation and restoration, not necessarily sea level rise adaptation, although mm -hmm. perhaps I misunderstood or could be adapted to that. Well, they're, they're both together, right? Mm -hmm. This, mm -hmm. this region yeah. has a unique opportunity. We won't have details in a few months. The, the San Francisco Bay has a unique opportunity because of its geomorphology mm -hmm. and its climate, its weather. Um, it is not suffering from hurricanes. So we can actually manage an incremental approach here. Nowhere else in the United States can they talk about that, except the West Coast. And San Francisco Bay is the biggest estuary on the West Coast. I mean, Puget Sound has a different situation because of its depth. Um, it has a very different geology. But the San Francisco Bay is an opportunity to bring the ecosystem services and the whole picture of what the future shoreline could be like to the future where the rest of the world is going to struggle with extreme events. That also makes, us, makes it easier for us to say that we are investment ready in the Bay Area, uh, not to put it in completely crass capitalist terms, but we will look like a better investment for housing, for corporate headquarters, for all kinds of things, because we are more stable than the rest of the world. And you look at it only through the lens of the Bay Area, it looks like a big dramatic change, disaster for wetlands. Yes, but in terms of the way this area is going to grow, I think the projections are too low. If you owned a house today in Colorado, where those big floods happen, or you owned a house today in Florida and saw the maps of where sea level is going to be in 50 years or 20 years, or you owned a house in an area that burns frequently all of a sudden in Southern California, and you looked at the Bay Area, and you thought about how relatively stable it was, you think about moving if you had the resources. So I think we'll see a lot of people with resources relocating to the Bay Area. And the 30% population increase that I think ABAG has um, estimated for 2040 or 2030, um, I think it's actually low. So how do we tap that growth and make it something that's a manageable shoreline without being precious about exactly where that shoreline is? I think the idea of filling to be able to make a 200-year viability shoreline and build ecosystem marshes into it makes a lot of sense. Rather than getting all focused on where was the 18-something shoreline. Not relevant, guys. Not really, not for the next 200 years. So I, I just wanted to you know, leave you with that thought because that's the kind of thing that I can say. Um, <laughs> hopefully that helps a little bit with uh, thinking about what the rest of the world is doing and what our situation is here. Second, and the speakers are going to come up here, and we can have question and answers. And I think maybe the easiest way is if you have a question, just raise your hand. Bob Swafford. Um, yeah. Uh, 
apropos of uh, well of everybody's presentation, but especially uh, Christina's, how confident are we in, in terms of the climatology, the geomorphology, whatever it is, how confident are we long term, 100 years, 150 years, that this area would not become subject to East Coast type weather catastrophes? 40 foot storm surges coming through the gate, that sort of thing. I have never heard any climatologist say that that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that that kind of perturbation of the climate is anticipated for any reason. Just because of the existing wind current, you know, wind patterns in the West States. It's circulation. It's all about yeah. low level start circulation. Sure. And that seems to be, it's, it's changeable with climate change, but not that changeable. Not that changeable. It, it, it just the uh, distance of wave faction. Mm -hmm. I think the question was asking me to comment on uh, pumping of stormwater. Um, it's definitely something we look into, and actually I kind of tend to agree. Pumping is, I think, kind of where we're headed um, by not you know, planning well enough, and it is, it's probably the most costly way to deal with stormwater. So uh, whether we have to pump every drop immediately, that's where we get into this combined analysis of watershed flooding with sea level flooding, and sure. you have to make a lot of scenarios, And but we have, um, probably, I don't know, six or eight pumping stations right in sort of the Richardson Bay area alone already. So we're headed towards a, uh, a future of more and more pumping. And I think, um, you know, it's, a, it's definitely problematic. So I kind of see, but, you know, we do have a certain, you know, other approaches in Ross Valley are looking at detention storage, you know, building, uh, using, raising Phoenix Lake, using some ball fields for the storage. So, but the water doesn't go anywhere. So if you don't store it, you're going to be pumping it or you're going to be flooding. So. It, um, it's definitely a concern I have because I think we do do a lot of pumping and um, it's very inefficient. And I think it, it's part of my thing is let's, let's plan because if we are going to pump a lot, we should build a central generator. So right now we fill generators for each pump. In fact, the last pump we just put in on seminary in, in public works doesn't have a backup generator because we couldn't afford it. Because it was another close to a million dollars. So. You know, the power always goes out when it rains hard, so we have a pump there that <laughs> is really not backed up. So I think we're um, internally suffering from resources and not planning well enough. So it's a really uh, uh, something that I worry about quite a bit. That is the New Orleans path. Yeah. You start not building the backup generator because you can't afford it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the path. Um, so I think this idea, though, to my mind, is uh, getting a handle on flooding from both ends. Um, you know, other places, they have three or four weeks. They know the flood is coming. We have very steep watersheds in Marin, very short, steep, so we get flash flooding. That's what, that's kind of more our thing. We don't get a lot of notice. When it rains, you know, we might see, we'll get the river, the creeks will rise quickly. So um, we're, that's it. Everybody has their own challenge. That's just the truth. Ours are different than some of these other locations. Yes, question. Um, hi, I'm uh, Bill Carney with Sustainable San Rafael. And I love the 200-year time horizon. And in reference to that, I'm wondering from the county's viewpoint, uh, MBCDC's viewpoint, um, can these horizontal levees and uh, accretion by marsh, et cetera, those kinds of solutions I've heard are good for maybe five feet, four or five feet. 200 years, it's likely to be much greater than that. So I would like, a you know, how, how far will it get us? To what height will it get us? And then my other question, I'm really glad, Christina, that you tied all this to money because it, it seems to me that that's really critical to getting anything done. And again, I go to this question of how high do we need to plan for and therefore to complete that nexus, not just to dollars, but back to mitigation of climate change, which is going to drive this way over any levy we can build at this point unless we mitigate. So how do we make that nexus and maybe along the way get some of the primary causers of climate change, like the fossil fuel industry, to start paying for some of both the adaptation and the mitigation. Um, I'll jump in um, briefly and say that, yeah, the idea of the transition zone that I presented is what's called the horizontal levy. So we were talking about the same thing, just for clarification. and. That zone makes a lot of sense when you already have a marsh. And so by building that gentle slope, you're essentially buying that marsh some time to try to preserve itself as sea level rises. But there is a point at which you have to return to the conversation and look about what it is protecting. 
And I think there was one bar on my adaptive management slide that says they're realigned functions. Um, Ocean Beach is the best example that I can think of where they said, okay, we're gonna move Ocean Highway and start realigning the shoreline. And so that's a, a large, especially collaborative, comprehensive planning question. And so I think that the um, Tornal levy is sort of an in-between step before we have that conversation in terms of how many feet it will buy. I think it depends on the site. But to the extent that humans take on a kind of geologic role, uh, like the Dutch have been willing to do already with the idea of the sand engine, um, we can build a super dike that would go 50 feet high. We will have to get a lot of material. <laughs> and some of that will probably be urban rubble that we recycle. But it's possible that some areas will invest in that. And it's possible we'll see it in some parts of the Bay. I wouldn't be surprised to see places in the South Bay start thinking about that. Once they realize this is all happening for real, they have the money um, to move some material. And I think it can be done. But the question of marshes keeping up, um, even the cartoon that Sarah showed shows that at some point topography doesn't allow the marsh to go up, or the marsh is going to have to move on to some Walmart parking lot, and we're going to have to spend money to prepare the ground for that marsh. So there are definite challenges along the way. Um, I guess I prefer to think in the 200-year frame about something like a super levee that has a mud flat marsh side on it, and thinking like the Dutch, that we would take on the Sisyphean task of maintaining the toe of that levee with a biologically active shore <coughs> forever. And I also hope that mitigation is part of the 200 year plan, <laughs> because if not, if it is, then we can imagine sea level rise tailing off in rate. Not going down, but tailing off in rate. And then we can stop worrying so much about a huge super levee. If I can make these, uh, a couple of the challenges, and this may change in the future, but as a culture, you know, working in, in here, the Europeans, um, uh, much more use of uh, things like eminent domain, things that, as a culture, we does especially in public works, we stay away from, you know, to the extent possible, and all that may change, may need to change, you know, there may need to be more focus on that, but we, you know, we, and, you know, there's a lot of private property owners, and as a government, we don't take, so it has to be kind of worked out, and I think there's a lot of challenges there. When you talk about these very, very high water levels, and I think you get into the big questions of, uh, should we abandon, should we, you know, level Mount Tam and use that fill to raise a super dike. I mean, you know, we have the fill, let's get stuff there on the hill. Um, but, uh, but those questions are big and there's some, and they're almost beyond the comprehension of being a little in public works at this point. But I think we need to start planning make, down that road of planning for the near future, maybe the medium, or long term. I, I think yeah. active citizens, I mean, you have yeah. to recognize the situation these folks are in, right? They can't say a lot of things. They face liability restrictions, they face policy restrictions. Uh, there are elected officials who are trying to manage their relationship to the truth and the public at the same time while the media is kind of in the mix. And uh, we have to help as active citizens to say the things that no one else can say and recognize why they can't say it and keep saying it. That's how this dynamic has to work. We need to be out front for them so they can, we can talk about reducing liability for coastal engineers. The Dutch have tried experiment after experiment, reversible experiments. We need to try lots of reversible experiments in the Bay, not be so precious about what's natural, and try experiments that we can reverse if they screw up. Because that's the only way we'll learn, and that's why the Dutch are selling us their expertise, because they have tried reversible experiments. Yeah, that point is right on. I mean, a lot of the permitting how uh, things are keeping us from doing things. You can't have impacts to anything that's threatening or endangered. So even if they might wash out and they're rising sea level, you can't do things that might impact them now. So you're because I really I totally agree that in the Bay, our wave heights are not that high. So we really have opportunities, but we're dependent <laughs> on both sides, really, from the, um, I think, in a lot of just the permitting rules are going to have to change if we're having this discussion about things that have to change. And the same kind of activist movement that prevented the Bay from being filled right. in the 1960s has to now create an optimized shoreline for the next 50 years. We and have to do it. Okay. Yeah, and to that point, I guess I'll just um, bring up that I know you guys are probably aware that BCDC already has climate change policies, which were, I think, not as easy to get approved as we had expected. And so um, 
we are definitely trying to begin that adaptation process. If you pose a project now, you have to consider sea level rise. So that's an important first step for projects that are um, in the works. You know, and we do we do permit pilot projects because we do want to start that learning. And so we are in our own transition because the fill that we were fighting is not the fill that we may need. And so I think that having you all propose really sensible adaptation projects is the way that our agency is going to make this transition. So it really is a partnership. We can't propose things at Corte Madera because we'd have to permit ourselves. But um, you know, we're trying to just help the region move forward. On that note, um, I would just sort of put forth, like if we're talking about liability and funding in this situation, um, you know, we're, when the rubber meets the road, the only agencies who actually seem to have that kind of ability, when you're talking about the difficulty in a mo relatively modest beach project, um, the only agencies with that kind of sort of scope and grasp are you know, the Bureau of Reclamation or the Army Corps. And they've demonstrated over decades their inability to uh, come up with adaptive solutions and think about the future and not try to solve a problem, but you know, create a system that works and that'll continue to work. So as to your point about regional solutions, I mean, Marin County is famously affluent. You know, it's easy for us to talk about a place like that, but around the Bay, we have a lot of problems and a lot of problem communities. So I wonder, you know, what are we talking about here? Different regional agencies? Are we talking about the Army Corps changing its culture? Or are we talking about a new novel approach? Well, I'm really glad that you brought that up just because in any restoration projects, it's important for the BCDC is not the only permit you have to get. And so it'd be great if someone from, say, the Department of Fish and Wildlife or some of the other agencies sort of trying to enforce the Endangered Species Act were also at this, um, also on the panel because they would be able to speak to their current restrictions, which are, yeah, the water board, which are real. And so I think that it is going to take all of our agencies working together. And exactly how that's going to happen, um, I can't predict, but I think it's what's needed. And the, well, I was just saying, that's the transition we're in right now. Everybody's talking about it. Hopefully, at some point, you know, come some kind of consensus. But I think the awareness level is very high now among the agencies. But no one knows how to do. A lot of them have their own restrictions about what they can or can't permit, and they have their own agenda. So it's a, it's an interesting time because we're living in it right now. This, you know, what? How do we make this happen? Well, I was talking to Sarah about the possibility of. <clears throat> protecting that dike that's outboard of the Muzzy Marsh and slowing down the erosion of the mar Muzzy Marsh, which is occurring daily. Um, and so there are clapper rail in that marsh. I mean, every time I do monitoring, I almost fall over one. Um, so do you think Fish and Wildlife is going to be excited about trying to help with some project to preserve that, uh, that dike? What, what, what would you estimate? I don't know if I'm going to have any insight into what they're thinking, but I, I agree with you. They should. Yes, it's hard for them because the Endangered Species Act means they can't do, they cannot take. So you have to do things that don't impact the species, even if they might drown out or so. So there's a, you know, I mean, they're hemmed in too. Well, um, if, if, you're, if you're talking in terms of preserving habitat for them, should yeah. that not alter their... I mean, it probably does, and probably okay. I don't know. Yeah, I think what you're sort of getting at is um, to do some of these new things, there may be some sort of short-term, very short-term impacts to get long-term benefits. And so how we start weighing that... There shouldn't be any impacts. Well, then... <coughs> I, then the project I'm thinking of. That'll make it even easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, in fact, it's not Hi, yeah. Hi, I'm Pamela, and uh, thank you very much for showing us what's going to happen out there. I've noticed um, I'm with the environmental forum of Marin. I'm also with a group called Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, and they believe exactly what this kind of gentleman was alluding to, that a lot of the first world problems are affecting the third world first, specifically sea level rise, because they don't even have the resources to build stuff if they had the knowledge there to do it. So I'm kind of wondering, you showed me what we, what we can do if sea level rise happens. I'm also an activist. What can I do to help cut the red tape, 
um, on these greater issues of the fact that a lot of, even Marin County, the flood level maps, I believe, are the lower social economic communities first, if I remember correctly. Uh, not necessarily, but I believe, if I remember, I'm not, I'm not all of them I said, I'm, I'm negating, it's not 100%, but across the world, without a doubt, a lot of the sea level rise I'm noticing um, that has dramatic consequences is in areas of lower social economic status. What can I do? I mean, I can go into my local, uh, I guess, agencies and try to plan for rules to be changed. That's not really going to help. What else can I do? What can I do as a citizen with no engineering skills to make sure that specifically my community, because I live here, starts adapting to this? And on a greater kind of citizen of the world level, who do I start addressing these uh, first world issues that are, you said uh, that it's uh, awareness is rising. What's next step for me? I could talk about a little bit about that. I mean, it's, you know, it's a very big question of how do all of us act in the world. There are lots of aspects of that. But locally, I think that there's a surprising twist on what may help in terms of social equity. And I actually believe that there's a way to align new higher income housing along the shore in some places as a funding mechanism and a way of keeping people who will pay attention looking at the levees. In the Netherlands, they have a, a thing called Dyke Patrol. It's great. They have video <laughs> games. You know, you can learn to monitor dikes and so on. We need people who have the time and the education and the attitude to be watching what happens with these new shorelines. And they need to live there. And that will protect people who live in what would have been a floodable zone in the interior. So I think that there are places where we have to look at bringing housing into the mix very deliberately and creating an alignment of interests that might bring developers and other moneyed interests into this conversation. Um, so I think we should look at that. On a global scale, uh, what we see is a refugee situation, not only from sea level rise, but from drought in the interior. And that will be a political destabilizing force. And what I think is going to be is a huge distraction for the de developing some kind of solutions. Because we'll make that into a military issue and not into an environmental issue. And that's something we all have to track as policy is being made. That we're not responding with guns to something we should have responded to with infrastructure. So whenever the Dutch tell me that their cities are becoming climate proof, I laugh and say, but what about your supply chain? What about your financial trading partners? If they're not climate proof too, you're not climate proof. London can never be climate proof because it's a financial hub. If, if the supply chain for manufacturing in Bangkok is affected by flooding, then the major companies will be affected and the economy will do a nose dive. I think that the, the world is now too economically tied together for us to say that we're not, that anybody can climate proof. So how do we spend our own money to make those places better? That's a really big question. I just that um, locally, um, um, we're, I think Richardson Bay, we're using it a little bit as a lab and we're gonna lay out some ideas for adaptation planning that might include you know, uh, areas, you know, where do we wanna protect? Where can we not afford in the long term? Looking at phasing and uh, sometimes the only people that show up at, at things are people who have interests. You know, they're <laughs> soccer people or dog people or this or that. And the, you know, the, the majority of people don't really show up, so just being involved really counts. I can just tell you from a, a perspective, I'm sure uh, you know, planning is the same thing, is that uh, um, you know, support that other voices, a lot of people, the only people who show up often just are defending a small aspect of, their, of what they're interested in and not looking more regionally. And, oh, just one more thing to add. Um, I think that the work that Kate Fear is doing, working with a small group of community members is an idea that you know may be able to be spun up other places around the bay, and it's really about those community members coming up and starting the conversation about what are our values, what's our vision for this area, because I think it's um, easy to think about these are some strategies to preserve wetlands, but you have to combine sort of the natural and the built into that holistic vision of your shoreline, and that comes down to you know where you, what you guys want to live in. I mean, engineering can provide the cost estimates and the how-to, but the values of the community have to be integrated, and so I would encourage you to look at the Adapting to Rising Tides website just to get a look at some of the tools that are currently available, you know, and then maybe you want to start similar conversations in your communities. Okay. 
Okay, this will be our last question. Oh, here. Okay, it's just a really easy one. I think. Oh, okay. Well, it's easy enough. <laughs> Maybe one more last. after me. But <laughs> um, is there? Do any of you know if any of the um, the brain power and money in Silicon Valley are there any forums like this down there that are talking about this that are beyond just the the interests the individual interests? Are there any of the technology people that are seeing that this could be a threat to them too? And their homes. Yeah. 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 So, you know, are there any leaders that? Yeah, I know that um, a commissioner, a Dave Pine, I believe, had a forum where he got together a lot of folks in the South Bay. Um, I, I, I think I can follow up if we were more specific information, but they're definitely yeah, they, involved. The Good. South Bay people are excited to know that there's all these billion dollar companies that they can tap <laughs> to raise money. We unfortunately don't have that here so much. Uh, um, but uh, they're definitely talking to Google and Facebook and saying, you're going to be flooded, so help us you know, pay for these improvements. It just um, seems like the nine counties should be, you know, it should be yeah. better, of course. But, and right. maybe they'll see that at some point. Right, and that speaks to the Resilient Shorelines Initiative that I mentioned was just getting started. And BCDC is working with the Coastal Conservancy and ABAG and other regional agencies so that we can start to frame that conversation so that we can recognize that although solutions need to be different in different places that we're not um, having to reinvent the wheel necessarily all over the place. Okay, very patient. Truly the last question. Yeah, followed by the Port of Madeira Flood Board. Uh, I think the, the idea of having uh, tidal uh, surge gates on some of the small creeks that feed into the bay uh, may be environmentally better than uh, trying to have flood walls going all the way back along the creek where, as you say, people that are disenfranchised from the water and, and not really paying attention to it. Uh, it I don't know if there, there are environmental issues associated with that. You would, of course, <coughs> only use it when there is that king tide and it's, it's liable to flood with the storm. And you might have to have the, the gate closed at low tide so you'd have some reservoir for the rainwater. But is you see that as a feasible solution on some of the creeks. Oh, absolutely. That's something I'm very interested in. Uh, currently, probably could not get permitted. So there are definitely environmental impacts, even though they only may be active for a few days a year currently. Uh, but I think that is a coming um, big um, local uh, fight, a bad word, but you know, subject of a lot of interest, especially as the tides rise and people flood more. There's going to be a lot more pressure on the agencies to approve these. And, um, but uh, currently, I think it'd be very difficult. Um, uh, but you know, we have some creeks that bear fish and some that don't. So part of my thinking is, you know, let's plan adaptively all regionally, and maybe we can put them on some and save levees there, and others that have fish, maybe we don't. We put a few more levees there. And so that kind of thinking, though, is definitely uh, the way to do it. But I, I think that the tide gate is a temporary. It's a stage in the solution process because at some point it's not just the extreme event. At some point we have to keep it closed at the mean high tide right. and at some point you have to keep it closed at low tide so that becomes a barrier uh, over a period of time and you have to have a long-term plan for what that's going to be next and that's the critical part that takes a lot of creative thinking well thank you very much I want to thank you all for coming and hope that you've learned some things today that are food for thought. I think the speakers have demonstrated that there's a willingness for them as individual agencies to work together, but we really do think and, uh, and I think can see now that we need a collaborative approach. In terms of actions, as Tamala brought up and, and Christine responded to, one of the things you can do is Every time you hear of projects in your community or you hear decision makers, we all have to convince and talk to them constantly that any project going forward must include evaluation and planning for sea level rise. This is something that we have to start budgeting for, including I just got on a planning commission in Sausalito, and they're certainly going to be hearing it from me, but I think they knew that anyway. Um, 
we have to do this, and that's something every one of you can do. Um, recently, we had this huge project uh, for a new highway out here in, in Diane's area, Diane's community. Caltrans doesn't even, even consider sea level rise. This is absurd. So every time you have a chance to participate in your, at your city level, at your county level, talk about sea level rise. We've got to start the planning. I hope you enjoyed the speakers we all did. Uh, I really appreciate that they all came. And thank you all for coming. And just a couple more minutes. Uh, hope you'll join me in one last round of applause, not only for all our wonderful speakers, but our co-coordinators, Vicki Nichols and Sandy Goldman. And, and the entire forum board. Thank you very much. They worked very hard. Again, as a follow-up on this session, the Marin Environmental Forum's website, marinefm.org. If you remember nothing else or write down nothing else, marinefm.org. Very important. Hopefully, you'll check it regularly for a number of reasons. Upcoming sessions, follow-ups on this session, the master class coming in, in fall, uh, I'll mention again. But uh, do check that out, and, and we'll see what further information can be available. Sometimes we can put up some of these slide shows. Sometimes we can't. Uh, as sometimes there's a glossary of terms, expanded reading resource list, et cetera. We'll uh, put up as much as we can as soon as we can. And uh, please, uh, some of the speakers can hopefully hang around for a few more minutes in this room or if we need to clear this room out in the lobby. Make sure you all, if you do nothing else, take the bookmark with you. It has, you know, take several. You can carry them in your purse or your wallet or your pocket. Give them out to friends. We want as much attendance as possible. As I say, a lot of work goes into this. We want to share this. We're in the business of educating people. We're thrilled about this great turnout. Take the bookmarks with you, which give the dates and the topics. Uh, and there's some other literature, including a few flyers left, I think, on the back table uh, for the wildfire session, which is four weeks from today, right here, 9 to 12, wildfire, and then the final session on transportation and land use on uh, Wednesday, April 9th, from 7 to 9. Uh, I think that's just about it. Um, uh, hope we'll see as many of you as possible. Thank you again very much for coming, and keep on doing what you're doing.